Trustee Nielsen, we didn't hear that he wouldn't be here, so hopefully he'll be here soon. And Student Trustee Penbech, he can't be with us today, so we wish him well. And with all that, Angie, I can say everybody else is present except for Trustee Nielsen. And I'm just going to wait for her because she's doing something important. Well, welcome, everybody. And we have no items to be taken out of order. So that brings us to item 3.1, and we're going to move that to the following meeting. So we are at item 3.2, longevity and recognitions. Well, we, do, we do have three uh, recognitions that we want to make sure that we do. And the first one is Clarice Hillebrand, and Kathy Malloy is here to talk about Clarice, or maybe it's Katie. So I will be playing the role of Kathy Malloy. <laughs> that works. That, that works. I hope I can do her justice. <clears throat> Sorry also for the late arrival in the state of my clothing. I was thinking on the way over here, since we're talking about a wonderful costume shop supervisor, I need her to make me a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> but timing is everything in the theater. Fortunately, I've made it. Um, Clarice Hillebrand, who we wanted to speak about today in theater, and are so glad to have her recognized for her 10 years of service as a costume shop supervisor. Uh, first worked in the costume shop at Santa Barbara City College in 1979 for a few years. Then she took about a, a 10 years off to take care of her children and came back in 1994. In 2008, she stepped into the role of costume shop super supervisor, a job which involves running our student labs, cutting material, measuring actors, constructing patterns, stitching, dyeing costumes, and making alterations. We calculate she's worked on more than 200 Santa Barbara City College theater productions. That means she has sewed, altered, crafted more than 10,000 costumes during her time here. But sheer quantity could never convey the quality of Clarice's work or her personality. Her meticulous care of each detail, her ability to work with all kinds of people, and personal warmth and kindness that have touched and inspired every one of us in the theater department. Thank you, Clarice for everything, all your hard work. We really appreciate it. So I always get my exercise with this, which is fun. Uh, Lisa Lopez has been here 20 years, and Paul Bishop, Dr. Bishop, is here to uh, honor her. <laughs> it's all like conference food. <laughs> well, members of the board, President Beebe, it's my pleasure to stand before you today to honor Lisa Lopez for 20 years, not 15 like last time. Uh, you probably recognize Lisa because she was just here at our last meeting being recognized uh, as one of our everyday heroes as well. Uh, Lisa is currently the administrative assistant in my office and we've worked together for the past 13 years. Seems like just yesterday, but it's been that long. Uh, Lisa began her career at SBCC uh, as an administrative assistant to Gail Baker, one of our former deans, and then in 2004, Lisa assumed her current role in the IT department. During her tenure in the IT department, Lisa has been a stabilizing force in an area that 
has seen a lot of change since 2004. She has assisted our department in transition from multiple manual systems to a highly automated digital environment. Lisa has quickly mastered new terms, concepts, and has shared her knowledge of our new cloud-based services with many of her coworkers in other departments. Upon mastering our new calendaring system that we just implemented, Lisa's been instrumental in coordinating and scheduling all our IT meetings and, and, and rooms, uh, assigning the appropriate room and resources for each of these events. She works closely with our neighbors in the foundation, helping them to master the technology in our conference rooms, which they use quite frequently. Uh, and most recently, she's worked with business services to assist them in their rollout of time clocks for hourly personnel. She was the IT liaison for all the technical components of that installation and continues to orchestrate the IT response to any tech technical issues that they encounter with that system. Lisa knows the campus well. She, after graduating from Santa Barbara High School at least 20 years ago, um, she attended, <laughs> she attended SBCC, graduated with an AA in liberal studies, and in 2003, she got motivated again and went to uh, Cal State Long Beach and got a degree, uh, and graduated in 2005 in the professional studies program. And Lisa was such a great role model that both her daughters have gone to SBCC, graduated in two years, and then moved on to four-year institutions and got their degrees and now are finishing up master's degree, which <coughs> now is a challenge to mom, right? <laughs> uh, her husband's also an alum of SBCC and the only one in her household, Eddie, her, her pup, who has resisted at all attempts at training or higher education. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would like to personally thank Lisa for all her contributions to our department, for being a great colleague <coughs> and a really good friend. Uh, please join me in giving Lisa a well-deserved round of applause for 20 years of service. for the great work and great colleagues that I have here. Um, I really enjoy working with each and every one of you. Um, my heart is in Santa Barbara City College forever, and uh, I do have a little bit of cold, excuse me, but I just really love working here and working with the people and extending my services to whomever needs them. So I have gone through multiple departments, and I've reached out to many, many, many of our colleagues and um, with open arms and have been received well. And I just wanna thank everybody for a great opportunity to work here and be so happy about doing it. <laughs> so thank you very much. So Chantel Marquise is our final person that we'll be recognizing, and we have Dr. Mona Lisa Hassan here to uh, honor her. Good evening, board, uh, board of trustees and guests. Uh, it is my pleasure to honor Chantel Marquez. She's uh, such an asset to the department and human resources, uh, resources. I always say that human resources is the cornerstone of the organization because just think about it, without human resources, none of us would be here today. <laughs> so I, I think that it's important. And uh, so I say that Chantel and her role in um, administering the recruitment of administrators, ed admins, uh, and faculty full-time changes lives every day. A lot of students are impacted by the work that she does and ensuring that our recruitment processes are sound and that we're uh, employing all the guidelines that we need to diversify our staff. But besides that, uh, Chantelle is just an excellent mother. She has a son, Dom, Dominique, and I, th I feel like I know him personally uh, on many levels, but she's a wonderful mother. She's a product of this uh, 
co uh, beautiful community as well. And that's my uh, unscripted speech, so I guess I should go here to make sure that I don't forget anything, but we honor Chantel Marquez for 10 years of dedicated service to the students and employees of the college. Thank you, Chantel. Chantel has served as an HR professional since 2008 with all aspects of faculty and educational administrator recruitment and selection. She puts her heart into everything that she does for the college. Chantel has initiative and understands her role is aligned with the mission and the vision of the college. It is with great pleasure that we uh, present Chantel with the award for 10 years of dedicated service to, to the Santa Barbara City College. I was just going to address you too, Dr. Beebe. Dr. Beebe, members of the board, thank you for recognizing my 10 years of service at Santa Barbara City College. You know, ever since I stepped foot on this campus, it seems like I've been here for a lifetime because everybody on this campus is so happy, so just grateful to have a job here. And that's one of the reasons what drawed me to um, working at Santa Barbara City College. I want to thank everybody who was on my initial hiring committee, um, seeing something in me and moving me forward to be hired as an HR Tech One. Thank you to Sue Ehrlich for hiring me in the HR Tech One position. Also to Pat English, um, my former VP of Human Resources. Thank you for allowing me to work with you side by side every day and to really help me grow in my career. And then also to um, I'm trying not to cry. <laughs> I wasn't getting emotional. I was doing pretty good. Um, I also really want to thank um, my HR family. Some of you are here today. Some of you are watching. And I just really want to thank you because I, I appreciate you. You guys work really hard I, each and every day. I'm really passionate about what I do and the work that I provide. And so is my team up there. Um, so thank you guys for supporting me, past and present. HR um, family, thank you. You guys rock. state I did forget um, to thank Dr. Mona Lisa Hassan for also um, uh, recognizing me earlier this month with the Everyday Hero Award. I truly appreciate that. Thank you, Mona. Well, congratulations to everyone and we love that you guys do this and thank you for doing it here at the board meeting. I guess you guys could have your own private session and you don't and so thank you because that's enjoying for us too. Um, Item 3.3, the 2018 Administrator of the Year, and you're still here. Yes, would you like to come up? So it is my honor again to uh, acknowledge our wonderful managers that we have. Uh, let's see. The Santa Barbara City College has been acknowledging the accomplishments of our outstanding administrators since 2013, so for a few years now. The event is co-sponsored co by the Santa Barbara City College Foundation, and I'm not sure if Jeff is here. Um, I guess he couldn't make it, but he helps support the awards that are provided to our nominees and to our, our outstanding administrator of the year. So this is a time when we honor managers who are not only manage, who not only manage but exhibit leadership qualities, including dedication, commitment, innovation, uh, belief in lifelong learning, and ability to serve in alignment with the mission and the vision of the college by modeling professionalism, motivating others, understanding others' perspectives, and a commitment to teaching and learning. We have a small but mighty team of 51 dedicated management team members. Um, this year there were four very deserving administrators who were nominated for this award. 
the selection for the 2018 Outstanding Administrator of the Year was made by a vote of the Advancing Leadership Association and the President's Council. Uh, 36 individuals responded to the survey and we now have the results. Drum roll. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to introduce now Dan Watkins who's here and so please welcome Dan Watkins as he comes up to highlight excerpts from the nomination submissions for three honorable mentions, and finally, our 2018 Outstanding Administrator of the Year. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Peavy, board members. It's an honor as a former, I think the only remaining former Administrator of the Year uh, award winner to uh, read the um, descriptions of our honorable mentions and our winner uh, and present the awards uh, for the Outstanding Administrator of the Year. So the first honorable mention goes to Jim Clark. Jim Clark began his career at college. <laughs> Jim has been here since 2008. He serves as the Director of Information Technology. His major accomplishments at SBCC include the implementation of the Information Technology Work Order System, the Media Enhanced Classrooms, and the creation of the Computer Refresh Asset Database. Over this last year, Jim has embraced the role of Chief Security Officer, leading the effort on analyzing our network vulnerabilities, identifying options to address or mitigate network exposure, and uh, has established targeted training for our SPC's community on our security practices. If you haven't had a security training, I highly recommend it. Jim is a wonderful colleague, and we appreciate his ability to work within a team. He's always willing to jump in and help wherever and whenever needed. Our management group and entire college benefits from his willingness to be of service. We have a great deal of respect for his attention to detail, his ability to follow through, and his professionalism. So, Jim? President Beebe, members of the board, uh, guests. Um, I'm very grateful to be uh, receiving this recognition, but I wouldn't uh, be here if it wasn't for the uh, outstanding team that I'm uh, privileged to be a part of. Uh, I work with an exceptional group um, that represents this college in an exceptional way, and um, I'm privileged to be part of such a dynamic department. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Just a couple more to go. <laughs> uh, our next honorable mention for Outstanding Administrator of the Year goes to David Wong. David Wong has been here. David Wong has been at the college since 1984, which is, I think, what, 33 years? No, I, I have on the, the dubious distinction of being the, the manager with the most experience at the college. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, if you don't know, serves as the director of institutional technology for the Faculty Resource Center. And although David manages small but mighty department, he has been at the forefront of learning technology at Santa Barbara City College. He's always had the highest integrity and interest in success of the college as a whole. There are countless instructors, staff, and students positively affected by his efforts. I know from many experiences that he has always given 100%, and that was from the person who nominated him. Uh, the college has been successful largely from David's passion for education and instruction. He is innovative, forward-thinking, practical in his approach to everything he does. He is an excellent planner, always trying to think ahead and plan for the unexpected. So congratulations, David. And our next honorable mention goes to Alan Price. Alan has been with the college since 2014. <laughs> For four years. If my math is correct. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> 33 was a little harder, but four years. Uh, Alan serves as Dean of Educational Programs, specifically in the area of career technology education. Alan provides a supportive environment in which to learn and grow. Alan's primary input is, how can I support you? Alan is always positive, no matter how difficult things get. Alan sees the positive and finds ways to resolve issues. Alan also understands the importance of professional team development for his team. The Health and Services Career Technology Department and Division benefit mightily and flourish due to Alan's many admirable qualities. The traits listed above, uh, which he so often demonstrates when multiplied across the division, help to explain much of the positivity from the employees within this division. Individuals within the department often comment on how fortunate they are to have Alan as a dean. So, congratulations, Alan. And that leaves our final person for the Outstanding Administrator of the Year 2018. And it's our own, very own President, Dr. Beebe. <laughs> Dr. Beebe has faced incredible challenges since coming to SPCC in 2016. Under his leadership, we have tackled and weathered a significant budget deficit and have put plans in place to guide our hiring and enrollment management. He has been a champion for our guided pathways efforts, which will transform how we support students. Beyond these big issues, Santa Barbara City College has faced unprecedented emergency response situations that have greatly impacted our campus and our community. Through the Thomas Fire and the Montecito Debris Flow, our community has faced tremendous stress, heartache, and challenge. At SBCC, our staff, students, and faculty were affected in different ways. Through it all, Dr. Beebe ensured that decision-making was prompt, considerable, considerate, and equitable. Dr. Beebe has firmly established himself as a community leader and as a visible, positive representative of the college in the community. He serves as the president of the Board of Directors for Partners in Education, he shares the wonder, where he shares the wonderful things SBCC is doing. At SBCC, he leads with heart and empathy and always holds firm to putting students at the center of everything we do and doing what's best for SBCC. Congratulations, Dr. Beebe. Certainly not used to that. Um, actually, it's, it's no secret that I really love giving out awards to other people, but I realize this is really much more difficult to receive one. Um, but I do want to say that we've got a team of 51 managers, supervisors, and, and administrators uh, on our team that are just absolutely fantastic. We meet, we meet frequently and talk about issues and concerns that we have, and it really is a spectacular group of people. Um, you know, being an administrator isn't always easy. There's things that come up, things that, you know, you would rather not have to get involved with, but the administrators are the ones that, that jump ahead and jump into it to try to solve it. And uh, that takes a lot of courage. And so all 51 of those folks really deserve a part of this award. Um, but I want to say that uh, in recognition of the, the people that I've, uh, were on the slate with me, um, Jim Clark, David Wong, and, and Alan Price. Um, I accept this award in your name. Well, thank you for doing, again, this recognition at our board meeting. Um, well, congratulations to everyone and Dr. Beebe. Um, as our one employee, we feel a little like, gosh, 
<laughs> they stole the thunder for us. Here. <laughs> but um, I just, Shock. I love that you guys, I genuinely love that you guys do this here. And I, I could be here for an hour listening to how much you guys love City College. So thank you. Um, that moves us to item 4.1, approval of the minutes from February 8th. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Is there a second? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes from February 8th, 2018. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. 5.1, there's no public no. comments? Okay. No. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Priscilla Butler, item 6.1, report from Academic Senate. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. Vivian. Congratulations, sir. That's very nice. Um, I think I'll start a little unorthodoxly, not having used that as an adverb, that's probably the part that's unorthodox, but <laughs> all of your hair looks amazing. <laughs> it's it's raining people look bedraggled but no you all look great so <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here I'm happy because this week has been a, a hard one to predict in many ways and people have been concerned and worried about so many things and I'm very happy that everyone is safe as far as we know and that we have gotten through another um, difficult time so a couple of updates about Senate news. Um, Robert was there yesterday. We had uh, an amazing talk by our faculty lecturer for this year, who is Anne Redding. And uh, she talked about the forces that influence crime and how that can serve as a, a signal, a warning signal about social issues that may need to be addressed. And it was very interesting, um, sometimes quite challenging to hear the content. But I wanted to highlight that annual lecture because it's one of the events we are most proud of. Um, to hear from another discipline that we're not normally in contact with or familiar with is a great opportunity and something that I think all academic institutions value very much. So it was very nice, yesterday's event. A um, couple of things that, that, one thing we're working on right now and one we recently finished up, um, we are reviewing our constitution and bylaws. And one of the changes that we're recommending and the faculty will vote on after the break um, is to add a non-credit faculty senator to the Senate. We do have uh, all part-timers represented by adjunct senator, um, but non-credit faculty communicated that they'd really like to have someone here, there who could speak directly from their own voice. So we're hopeful that that change will um, be approved. And then lastly, I wanted to mention one item that's on your agenda for today, which is BP 3900, speech, time, place, and manner. And the Senate did discuss the proposed changes in language and um, actually unanimously supported the, the new version. So thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you. Item 6.2, um, our per student uh, association vice president can't be here today, so he'll send us his report in We'll send it out to the rest of the board members. Um, item 6.3, uh, Liz Eckenclaus, report from classified employees. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, I also want to add my congratulations to Dr. Beebe. It's a very well-deserved award. And to the other honorable mentions, including my own supervisor, Jim Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to comment on the faculty lecture. I watched it through uh, live streaming. And it was one of the most thought-provoking ones I think I've heard. It was a little disturbing, but it touched me. So I thought it was very well done. And uh, the, the topic was very challenging, but it was one of the best ones that I've, uh, I've, I've listened to. Um, the classified consultation group has met a couple times. We had uh, Margaret Prothenow come and talk to us at, in, at length about guided pathways. And she explained uh, the new stage two and many of our members were able to sign up to participate in that. At that meeting, we also talked about uh, what had been discussed at CPC, uh, arming staff and faculty. We talked about that at length, and we all decided that was a very bad idea. <laughs> so we don't support that at all, which is probably not too surprising. 
which I don't think it's even legal, but still, arming our faculty and staff would not make us feel safe. And then we've also talked about some of the, the BPs and the APs. We talked about the speech one, and we also had a talk at length about the AP 7120, the hiring process, which we gave some input to. And so we'll see how that one progresses. And I think that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Liz. Item 6.4, Dr. Anthony D. So we talk a lot about sustainability at the college, and we have a, a sustainability plan that, that we're, we're moving forward on in multiple fronts, including things like uh, SBCC Commute, the perma permaculture uh, gardens that we have, recycled water uh, that we use for our plant beds, and uh, the Great Meadow, and different things like that. Um, but this week, we're also proud to be able to announce to you Sorry, I'm not, I'm not crying, I just have a cold here. <laughs> um, I'm, we're proud to be able to announce to you that um, we have received the first LEED certified building on the college campus. Um, oh, thank you. And um, it is, we've really hit the, hit the ball out of the park in terms of the level that we ended up receiving, which is platinum. That's just absolutely unheard of. Yes, Lindsay. <laughs> it's fantastic. So Vice President Lindsay Moss, um, Rob Morales, our Facilities Director, and uh, Perrin, uh, Perrin uh, Perigen, um, all did just spectacular work in making this happen. Um, it's really a model for uh, many of the community colleges across the country, across the country, yes, uh, in terms of being able to, to achieve this level. It's not easy. It's not easy to get platinum. Remember, our standard was silver. Um, and so we've, we've kicked it up uh, several notches um, to this particular level. So I just wanted to make sure I told you about that. We're going to have uh, uh, our grand, uh, a grand opening, I guess, or ribbon-cutting ceremony in June. Um, for the community, we'll invite the community, and it's going to be a nice uh, compliment to be able to tell them that we achieved this level of, of efficiency in this particular building, in the West Campus building. So, there you go. Nice. We weren't expecting that one, but we'll take it. Thank you to the team. Uh, item 6.5, report from board members. Yeah, Jonathan. Oh, so, I have an exciting legislative update. Uh, last week, I was in Sacramento on Wednesday with the Reclaim California Higher Education Group, and we had a short-term and a long-term ask. But we went to 30 offices, and I personally went to seven, and I, also, I, I wasn't the one that met with the budget committee staff personally, so it was really good because we were talking about the online college, and that was, we were against it, obviously, and I communicated that you know, everything we've heard here has been you know, not for it, and gave the message that we could be doing a better job if the money was given to us to expand our online systems. And I think most of the legislators were pretty on our side. I mean, it was kind of out of nowhere for them to, a few pushed back and said, oh, it could be good. You know, why, why do you, why do you think, a lot of them were asking, you know, why do you think the governor went and did this if you guys can do it yourselves? And, you know, there's, I think, a bigger answer there, but it seemed like that's not gonna move forward at all this session, but it has like opened the conversation. So maybe, I don't know what will happen next or if the next governor will propose it, but I don't think we have to worry about it this year. But yeah, there didn't seem much support. So that was, that was good to communicate and find out. And we were also talking about funding the CSU and UC, which are getting less than their ask in the budget, which CSU rejected 31,000 people who were qualified to get in this year, 31,000 people who like had a seat, you know, qualified, met all the qualifications, didn't get in because there wasn't enough money to, you know, pay to have them have classes. So we were lobbying also to have uh, those fully funded so that students can go to college if they've actually been admitted. Because if you don't get into CSU, you then come to a community college, which is good, but you know, what if, if you were qualified for that, you should go there and leave a spot open at a community college for someone else. So. Or it could have been one of our students transferring or trying to go to CSU and then they can't. So that's, uh, it, was, it went well, it went well. That, especially the 31,000 not being admitted to CSU really 
it's a shocker. It's a big number. Marcia. Jonathan, do we, or, or Dr. Beebe, do we know whether our students who meet the transfer requirements for CSUs are affected in that 31,000? I don't know. Hmm. <coughs> yeah, I don't really know off the top of my head whether or not that's going to affect them. Okay, because it could be the first year class, mm -hmm. yeah. or it could be the transfers that, that are our students. I don't think I don't know if transfer decisions have come out yet, but maybe it ends up being that some of them get rejected as well. So yeah. maybe. Well, we'll I, I'm just thinking if that's happening is certainly something that um, beyond the common sense support for funding this, mm -hmm. we should be joining with the CSUs and saying, you know, this is our problem too. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Anyone else? Yeah, Marty. Yeah. I keep getting these uh, invitations from the School Boards Association because I, I was our rep for a couple of years, and I really like that. All the school boards uh, send a rep representative, and they meet once a month, and I enjoyed going to them, hearing what was happening in the other schools. Alan Hancock sent somebody. Um, they're having an annual dinner on Thursday, April 19th, and I'm going to give this to our president and and maybe we can just send a little email around and see if anybody wants to go. I highly recommend it. And having done it, uh, I may be wanting to move on, but <laughs> but I do I, I really do enjoy this. They're going to have Monique Lamone come and speak to them too. So mm -hmm. I'll give thank that you to for you. reminding us of that. I think yeah. that that's yeah. it's good, and it's close by. It's mm -hmm. it'll be a nice little drive. Mm -hmm. Get some dates. No, it's a nice drive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone else? Well, I. Yeah, go back more. Uh, are we doing board report or are yeah. we? Okay. Um, I was just going to mention we had what I think is our last meeting of the ad hoc mitigation committee, and we'll be coming back to the board with some recommendations to see if the rest of you are in agreement. So. Sounds good. Um, anybody else? Well, I. Uh, I well, um, Veronica, yes. sorry. I, I completely forgot in the excitement of Dr. Beebe being our administrator of the year that we had gone to, I went to a Mesa town hall in which Dr. Beebe was speaking. And it was a while ago, so that's why I forgot. But uh, I just wanted to compliment you because for some reason, I, I don't know what's in the air on the Mesa, but they love Santa Barbara City College again. And in 2010, um, we had students who were too noisy to to whatever, you know, that they really were up in arms against our students, but now, I don't know if the students are nicer or the Mesa people are nicer or something's in the air, but um, Dr. Beebe has enchanted them and I thank him for his uh, talk with them and, and his openness to listening to what they have to say. And it, there really is a change and, and I think it's good to be good neighbors to people. So yes. thank you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marty. Yeah. Well, and there's a nice rep for that area too. So it's a good. Nice partnership. Well, I got to attend the Tiara Ball uh, last weekend or the week before that with um, some of the folks in our allied health department. And our partnership with Cottage is just so important. So I just want to thank the foundation because every year this event, you know, there we are, you know, an event with over 500 people in our community and our Santa Barbara Foundation is well represented. And Cottage is so important to our nursing program. Um, and we're important to them. So. I think that's great. Um, in addition to, you know, that evening also, you know, I got to attend a little bit with Marty and Dr. Beebe on the Mesa. And after that, I headed over to the Granada because they had the big um, event there. And then there's Santa Barbara City College again. And so I just, I think we are physically everywhere and, you know, people are seeing us. And so I just want to thank the foundation because I think that when they support nonprofits in our community, it supports our mission. And there's so many complementing agencies out there. And I literally go all over the community now and I just find our name and our students and our programs everywhere. So thank you everybody for just having this great cross-functional vision to support a broader mission for our community because I think it's awesome. So keep up the good work. Um, that brings us to item 7.1, our consent agenda. Is there any items that anyone would like to pull? No? Okay. Um, so with that, we can we get a motion to approve Items 8.1 all the way through 10.4. So move. Second. Second, okay. It's been moved and second to approve items 8.1 through 10.4. Is there any discussion? 
No? I did just want to call out um, some of the items, and mm -hmm. I think I mentioned uh, to Dr. Beebe, not because I have any reservation with them, but there was a couple things on there that I think are really important to us. There is a new math course that's being developed, um, the Math 75 support, and I know we've talked a lot about that. Um, there's also looking at the assessment process, mm -hmm. and so these are all new things that are happening that I think are so important <clears throat> to the board and so important to our goals for student success. And if we could learn more about them, we'd love to hear about them. If not, in the near future, maybe yeah. yeah, so we are going to have a report to the board, and we've been talking about it uh, at PC and some other places, a uh, report to the board on our grants, Title III, Title V, um, some of the other grants that we have, um, so that you know exactly what's going on with those, mm -hmm. and so that when you see stipends that are, that are being used for these grants, you know what the, what's behind all of that. And so... I think in June we were talking, April? Okay, so in April we're gonna be having a comprehensive uh, review of all of our grants. And uh, so we'll be able to let you know about that. Okay, good, yeah, because we're approving today item 8.2, which is a, a, it's services with the Scott Education Services. And I Googled them and it, it's faculty coaching and it goes with our HSI grants. And I just thought that the board would be interested in that. Um, and then also we have an AB, because of the law in AB 705 coordinator to make changes in the assessment pro pl uh, placement process, and we've talked a lot about that. Um, and then 9.2, which is new courses for um, math and modified for English 111. So I just think that, you know, that's it. Even though we're not on the ground, when we read this stuff, we're like, wow, they're they're busy, they're getting there. And yeah, AB 705 really is a, a complete cultural shift for for all the colleges. Um, in California, but it's, it's basically this idea of making sure that if, uh, based on multiple um, uh, indexes and indis indices, that if a student can um, be able to go right into college level work um, and we have the support mechanisms to help that person be successful, then they should move into college level work and not start out at some of the lower levels of, of uh, basic skills. And there's, there's data that show that um, students that do start out in college level um, can be successful at that uh, without having to go through the, the basic skills uh, uh, levels. Um, like I say, this is a cultural shift. It's something that we're all still trying to get a handle on, um, but we have a team of folks that are looking into this very closely and uh, making sure that whatever we do in terms of the movement in that direction is uh, going to be most advantageous for our students. So we'll give you a report on that too. Great. Thank you, Dr. Beebe. I just thought that we might appreciate that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <clears throat> motion carries. We have item 11.1, 11.2. We can take together. Is there a motion to approve? A motion to approve 11, 1, and 2. Second. second. Okay, it's been moved and second to approve items 11.1, 11.2. Is there any discussion? I just wanted to note, I think this is the one where we have uh, additional revenue from the foundation and say thank you <laughs> to the foundation. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Trustee Kreminger? Aye. Trustee Abood? Aye. Trustee Miller? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Gallardo? Aye. Trustee Haslin. Aye. Oh, sorry. Oh, and that's everybody, right? Yeah, that, that should be everybody. Okay. So motion carries. <laughs> sorry, for a minute I was <laughs> like, I don't know, for, maybe I was waiting for the rest of the thing. <laughs> okay, so motion carries. We're good. Um, item 12.1, approval to charge online only students the student health fee. And there is a... Um, a nice PDF PowerPoint. Um, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Marcia. Second. Uh, is there any discussion? I don't think we should do this unless they're in district or in the county. I don't think someone who lives in LA and taking a class at SBC online should have to pay this. 
I, I, or we do think we'll get a we'll overview of the, of the slides there. I think, you know, having been an online student with Cal State Fullerton and, um, and uh, L.A. and the different CSUs down south, I think the way I understand it is that even though I was remote, I could, have, I could still call the health services mm -hmm. and I could still get referrals. I do agree with, you know, anytime we charge students, I think that school systems – health offices and nurses and LVNs, for a lot of students, it's the entry way into the larger, broader healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And that's just been the case with our elementary schools, with our high schools. And I can imagine that certainly for our colleges that health centers and are the entry point to yeah. them getting further services. But Very much so. We've got uh, Lori here to talk about, if she can walk through the slide presentation with you. I think it'll help clear up some of the questions about it. I'm Laura Ferris. I'm the Director of Student Health and Wellness. I'm a data geek, so I have quite a bit of data here um, to present to you and basically share information with you. You may want to bring the microphone a little okay. closer. To share information with you. The current student health fee is set by the Chancellor's Office and we're at $20 a semester and $17 per summer session. In the community, um, California Community Colleges, 83%, a supermajority, charges online-only students the student health fee. And this is from a professional organization we, I belong to of our all the California Community College Health Services. Here are some of our sister colleges that charge the fee, everyone in Region 6, and also Pasadena City College and San Diego City College. What does the chancellor's office say about this? And this is from the legal fee handbook. They believe that the health fee may be charged to students who take online only classes. The health fee is not designated as a use fee and that even though students may take online only classes, it doesn't mean they're not gonna travel to the health center. And this is from 2010. Our own Tableau data shows that about 15% of students are online only. And it's great now that the IR can tell us where they live. So we have about 30 38%, 36% live in the tri-counties. And do online only students ask for our services? Um, yes. A lot of students can be on campus and then switch to online only because of school and work and different things that happen in their life. Their parents call, they're used to coming in, and um, Nancy Hubert, often our student finance, gets students who are wanting to have our services. You might ask us, what can we offer online only students? Um, there are fabulous online-only um, trainings and screenings that are usually subscription that um, we just can't afford right now. They're great health magazines. We already have an Ask a Nurse feature that we came up with a few years ago where students can email us and ask a question. And we're really, if this goes forward, we're really going to work on getting a distance counseling because it's really the mental health services that are extremely important to our students right now. And we actually have a licensed clinical social worker on our staff and they're experts at connecting students to services. So they can work with students in Sacramento or wherever they are to get them services they need. Are there any other fees we already um, assess to students, whether they use it or not? And yes, we already charge all on-campus students the transportation fee, and it's more than the health fee. And why am I here today advocating for students and my program that I feel so passionately about? It's that we're just like the college, we're suffering. Last year, we were $95,000 in deficit. Um, I've had to cut nursing positions. I'm, Lindsay knows I'm already always running to Lindsay. Um, student workers, we've gotten rid of all our student workers. We, and I strive to provide <coughs> services that are just like the big guys. I 
have relationships with Mary, Dr. Mary Ferris at UCSB, so I'm really aware of what are the standards of practice in student health, and I don't want to lose the wonderful services that we have. Here are some of, just a list of the, the things that we want to sustain. And we, just a reminder, Student Health and Wellness does pay the student insurance premium, which is about 30,000 a year. Very important is the National College Health Assessment. It's a national health survey that we can look at. How are our students doing with stress compared to national cohort and the California Community College cohort? Um, we do wellness activities, Roxanne Pate and the Wellness Connection, that's, that's um, student health and wellness and equity. We have peer educators and we really want to base our practices on community standards. Um, we're a safety net for so many students with um, uh, now that Affordable Care Act is in jeopardy and our our services are equitable across the campus. Anyone can come to services. And being healthy and well means you're gonna be a successful student. And we also, under sorta in the background, we work on big public health issues. We've had, just since I've been here in six years, we've had a student on campus with active tuberculosis. We've had the meningitis outbreak. We've had school shootings. All, we're a community college and we're affected by all these big issues. And as you brought up, the movement toward more online education, if we know 83% of California community colleges already offer online students, student health and wellness, um, services, we want to be on board so we can be attracting those students, whether this college initiative goes forward or not. Um, how will it be beneficial? First of all, it's always about students, always about students. And they are mental health services, even though enrollment has fallen, we are packed. We have 11 counselors, we have two full-time faculty, we are busy. It'll help our program. We're very excited. We have a new beautiful wellness space. We're gonna call it The Well. And um, if we're gonna develop that, the college has given us a beautiful space. So that'll be a place where peop uh, students can find community and we can have activities. They can take a nap. They're really excited about that. And then we want to um, offer, we want this to be for SBCC. It's, it, we support the health and wellness of the entire campus. And we contribute to student success. Any questions? So the other thing, you had a chance to talk with uh, the students or give this presentation mm -hmm. to the students, and what was that, how did that go? The student, the Associated Student Government voted to um, support this fee increase and I presented um, this same presentation to them and they asked questions and um, were interested mostly in, we, we offer like, a, we have a little mini urgent care center too, so we do offer medical services, but they're especially interested in our um, counseling services. So they were supportive and then the College Planning Council also approved it unanimously. Marcia. Um, I'm supportive of the students who are online only having that access and um, the mental health and counseling particularly that you mentioned. Um, is it without the fee that they actually don't have access? That's correct. So if, if you didn't charge them the fee, they can't call and ask for help, basically. You know, uh, we, we're members of the BIT team, Behavioral Intervention Team, and of course if a student needs connections in the community, um, referrals, we'll meet with them one time, but we don't offer ongoing services. Okay. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Is it possible to do like an opt-in? You know, 
just like health insurance, that really doesn't work. All the colleges that assess it, 83%, it's all students. It's sort of like if you could get health insurance at any time, you would just get it when you got sick. So it wouldn't sustain our program in the same way if, if, if it was an opt-in. I'm suspecting there's a legal issue there too, whether we're even allowed to do anything other than yes, no for that group of students. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Any other thoughts? Okay, well it's been uh, moved, it's been moved and second to approve the charge online only students, the student health fee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. That moves us to item 13.1. So this is the election for the triple, C, uh, triple CT board. Last year we first discussed the candidates, then we um, discussed uh, our, it asked Dr. Beebe if he had any suggestions, and then we went through our top five, and then if we had a consensus of a top five that Angie would tally for us, then we'll make a motion to vote. Do you guys want to, that sounds right? How did we do that? We first discussed <laughs> it, all the candidates went around, discussed it, then we asked Dr. Beebe if he had any suggestions or recommendations or anything he had heard, um, and then we just went around and gave Angie our top five. And then if she has a solid top five, then we'll make a motion to approve those candidates. What do you guys think? It worked well, and so we don't want to change it. Okay. <laughs> so we'll open it up um, for any thoughts of anybody that had any insights. Yes, Jonathan. Uh, I know Eric Payne really well. I, he was one of the first people I met when I went to conferences, and I want to give him my strongest endorsement to be on the board. Yeah, Marty. Yeah, I think it's important that we at um, SBCC have um, a like community college person. You know, sometimes we're kind of forgotten over here on the Central Coast. And so uh, I don't know Greg Pensa, but I think an Alan Hancock representative might be a good idea. I agree. I support the first five. <laughs> In that order. Let's In that order, yeah. Well, not, not in, in, in that particular order, but <laughs> selecting numbers one through five would be my preference. Okay. Anyone else? Neil? Any other thoughts? Unless you're ready to give your top, top choices. And, and there, for those of you wondering, it's all online. If you wanted to Google right now and say, ooh, who, what are the qualifications for these people? Um, their applications and their background is there. Um, I did think uh, Suzanne Wood's uh, experience with being director of financial aid and kind of having that student services background was different and nice to bring in that lens. And Palo Verde just seems like a little, kind of like Marty was saying, you know, it doesn't seem like it's the prominent one that would get the geographic support, you have north, south, and then we have us in the center, and then communities like Palo Verde. But if we're ready to select our top five, we can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marsha, you want to give us your top five? Um, I'll go with one to five. Okay, Marty. I'll take one, one, to, one two, three, five, and seven. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to name them instead? Would that be easier? I don't know what's easy for you. Let me get, let me get Marcia. Okay. There we go. Now it's going. Sorry, okay. Angie. <laughs> Do I do it by number or name? By numbers. Okay, okay. So one. Number one, two, three, five, and seven. Yes, Robert. One, two, three, four, and five. Uh, 
five, four, three, two, one. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just for fun. Troublemaker. <laughs> Mine are the same as Marty's. And one, three, five, six. Oh, sorry, it's Five, six, seven. And sorry, Dr. V, I assumed you didn't have any suggestions for us. I don't us. have any suggestions on these <laughs> folks, but I do think that um, the idea of Greg Pensa being from Alan Hancock uh-huh. and the Central Coast, he would understand some of our issues, so I, I think that's a good choice. I think everybody selected him. Okay, what do we got, Angie? Hmm? Same as Marty's. Times are by two. Hmm? The thing about two members were really right. right on the end. And it goes straight to <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, it's just great. Yeah, I know, but it's just, it's funny, these things are going faster, the boating. <laughs> Pencil and paper would be faster than this. We would have loved to do like an app or something, but I know everything has to be very public, Angie, and this is the most public way we can do it. So, but you're doing good, okay. telling it. So the top five are number one, number two, number three. Microphone. Uh, number five. Oh, hold on. One, two, five. One, two, three, five. And then you have a tie. Oops. Oh. Between? Uh, four and seven. Okay. So then we will then give your preference between, do you, would you guys want to do your preference between four and seven? And then just sure. go from there? Sure. To just tell Angie the number? Okay. okay. Marsha? Um, four. Okay. Seven. I didn't know if she's ready. Seven. Seven. <laughs> okay. All right. Four. Okay. Four. Oh, another tie. Seven. <laughs> seven. Yeah, you got another tie. Oh. Even with seven? Oh, you did seven? Mm-hmm. Uh oh. Oh, that is. Six oh, no, that takes it out of the tie. Really? Ah. Wait. I thought me, Marty, Veronica, yes, Marsha. Oh, what I thought. Did you say seven, Marsha? No, I took four. <laughs> yeah. But, but I. I did four. And you guys did four. I said each? four. 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 Oh, that is a tie. That is a tie. Three plus three, six. Oh. <laughs> That's what I thought. Let's do it again. <laughs> tie break. Uh, <laughs> um, what are we gonna do? Paradise. Anybody? A uh, quarter. A what did you say? Yeah. A dice? What is that? The scissors, rock, paper, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Ohlone College, that's in the Bay Area. That's near Fremont, Union City, in the East Bay. Okay. Um, pretty decent college. I sold my home, so I don't pay their bond money anymore last year. <laughs> um, um, Palo Verde, again, I, I guess my only pitch is that, uh, kind of to your point, Marty, that it's a smaller school, that I, community that I don't think would get the larger folks in the, in the poll, and I just really think they should have a voice, even though they're this tiny little community. Hmm. What else do we know? <laughs> you know, I'd be glad to change my vote because I don't want to sit here that no? much longer. <laughs> so let's Otherwise, do it. I don't know. Would you like to change it to? <laughs> um, no, from seven, I was on seven, I'll change it to five. But just for the sake of moving the meeting you forward. You mean four. four. I mean to four, thank you. Um, for the sake of moving the meeting forward, because uh, I'm sure they would both, each of them would serve well. We haven't had any bad uh, actors in this pool Mm-mm. ever. So. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Do you want me to name them for the motion, or just can I say one through five? You can say one through five. Okay. So is there a motion to appoint um, or to uh, vote? What is this? The two? Yeah. To appoint um, uh, candidates one through five. Motion to vote for them. 
Second. 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 Okay. okay, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Marty. Sure. I'll pass that along to the league. You owe me one. Yeah. <laughs> Taking one home for the team, noted. Okay, um, items 13.2, revision to board policies. This is uh, the final draft, um, our final uh, policy we have here, and we made some additions last time, so is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Second. I'll let you do it. Second. <laughs> It's been moved and second to approve board policy 3900 speech time, place, and manner. This, um, all in discussion? Nope. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mm. Okay. Motion carries. Board self evaluation. Um, so, this is in line with our um, board policies and to review the process we'd like to have for our board self evaluation. Uh, we decided to keep this last time only because we had just changed it, and oh, yeah. and then we said, "Oh, give it another year." Um, no one is married to anything. I think the goal is that we would that whatever we do, it is an authentic self-reflection of what we're doing here and why we show up um, every time we do to support our mission. So we can just open it up to any discussion of any thoughts folks might have. Yeah, Jonathan. I don't, I don't know if we did talk about this. But I think I remember us talking about this. Either way, I think the first part can be more binary or a rating system, and then the board goals can be more narrative because those are things we set every year differently, and the other ones stay pretty static. So it's probably better to keep those as a rating so we can see how we're doing over time on the more consistent ones. And then for the board goals, those change every year. So. I, I, don't know, I think a rating wouldn't work as well as just saying this is we did well on doing this particular specific thing or we didn't so we can know if we want to keep the goal or say it's done. Yeah, Marsha. I just wanted to mention for um, historic understanding of how we got here, it's my recollection that when we had uh, numerical options, we would get um, folks with some apparent concern or criticism or whatever of our performance, but then no detail. Mm -hmm. And so we pushed for people to actually have to express their thoughts. Uh, um, anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah. I, I, I tend to agree that a numerical approach might be more definitive. That is, we would get a sense of intensity of the feeling. But I also agree with Marsha's concern, which is that when, we, when we, we, we do come upon a sense of criticism, uh, we may find it difficult to give wording to that. And maybe what we need to do, if we do adopt a numerical system, is to encourage each other to, to be, you know, particularly when you come up with a number that is not what you had anticipated, that we, we actually say something. Um, but leaving it just with, with uh, verbal input, sometimes I found myself saying stuff just to be saying stuff. And, and that has its, that's equally useless. So uh, I, would, I would favor some form of hybrid that would allow us to be self-critical but then to explain what we mean. I was just gonna suggest there could be a hybrid where if you are expressing a concern by virtue of your numerical rating, mm -hmm. then you're expected to say something. I mean, yeah. actually say, then you should explain. Could, could I ask what, yeah. uh, what happens to the self-evaluations? It's for us, it's internal, it's a self-assessment of where we see ourselves in regard, really to our mission, but in really to our board goals, um, and to have a dialogue of authentic um, progress towards the duties that we're charged with. Um, and I mean, yes, it's an accreditation thing that we have to have this process, but our thinking has been, hey, we show up here because we care, we, we stepped up to serve as a volunteer because you want to, and, and really, 
and people show up to our meetings because they have to. Um, and how can we make this something that we can really authentically say, what are we doing? Is it going well? And that whole deal. It, it, it becomes an agenda item later in the year. And then we as a board discuss what we have all said. And, and, and it sounds like a, uh, a, a good uh, project to, to undertake. I'm obviously going to have some difficulty <laughs> answering many of them. Uh, although I, I, I meant to state earlier that I wanted to thank everybody here for taking the time to help educate me. <laughs> I've, I've met with uh, every member of the board now, and uh, it, it's been very helpful to my learning process. I also wanted to thank uh, President Beebe, who has graciously uh, given me some of his time to educate me on some of the difficult uh, issues we face. I, I'm really, uh, this is probably not on the agenda, but I, I just want to say it's, it's really been an exciting opportunity for me to, uh, to uh, learn more and more about uh, uh, the college, and I, I'm really, uh, really glad that, uh, that I, I'm in this position now to, uh, to, to help the school in any way I can. I also want to add that I thought the lecture yesterday was amazing. Um, and noted in the program that one of our uh, trustees uh, gave the, the lecture in 2001. So uh, um, he's generously offered me a copy of <laughs> his presentation. <laughs> then. So I, in any event, I think, uh, I, I, you know, I've been through this in other capacities, self-evaluations, and I think it's really a I think it's a really good idea, although it's reading through it. Even if I had been here longer, I can see it's a hard document to fill out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I filled it out when I was only on the board for a few months, too, and there's not much to say. Yeah. You can't really say much. <laughs> That's right. um, you, you asked what happens to this afterwards, and my understanding is that at the end of the time together, we we pile them up and we burn them, and if, if white, white smoke comes up, we, we do it over again. Isn't, isn't that your rec No? Okay. Well, luckily there is a board evaluation timeline that <laughs> tells you exactly what we will do, but yes. Um, my only thought was, um, last time I, I just remember some of us commenting that maybe it was just like too much, like it felt like homework, like you're going in there and just all this narrative. and. I guess a teacher in me, you never, I would never want to suggest that anybody does anything just because they feel like they're checking it off. Um, and your, whether it's written communication or oral discourse, it's going to bring value to our board. And so I would be in favor of having, like adding the hybrid metric one through five. But um, if you don't want to type anything, that you would just still come with your each section, and then we could also just have an oral dis dialogue discourse, uh, just talking. And we did that once. We had a facilitator, and we sort of just kind of talked. And and I'm fine either way, but if, if someone here doesn't find any value at all having to type up and it does feel like homework, then I, I don't think, oh, gosh, you don't want to think about it. I think if your venue is best to just because you are fine having a conversation, then I think that that's okay too. So I just want to throw that out there because the last thing we want to do is make anyone feel like they just have to type. Although I found it, I mean, to tell you guys, I, I went through the year because Angie puts everything on board docs. So it is quite quick you know, to find a lot of that evidence, but you could just find that evidence, jot yourself some notes with a pen and paper, and it doesn't have to be this survey monkey thing that has a deadline and then we're all lining up at graduation saying, oh my gosh, did we do the survey? Oh no, it was Dr. Beebe's survey. I mean, it gets to a point where we get busy so that was just my thoughts on that, that I trust that you guys are thinking and I, I see authentic conversations here. Um, so I don't know, just wanna throw that out there. I think the other thing that I recall from the conversation that followed was that there, there were too many questions, which is consistent with, with what you're suggesting. Um, but having said that, I don't, I, I don't have a clue as to which question I would eliminate. I mean, I think, if we have some time, we can, we can uh, have a couple of us look through it and see if we can reduce the size of, of this and still be uh, fully meaningful. Yeah, I mean, even for like the board goals, we don't probably need to answer how we accomplished each goal for like goal 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D, since they're all kind of related. If we can just say, okay, narrative for just what for the entire section, 
say something if you'd like. Then, you know, you're not probably scrambling to think, what am I going to put down for B if you have a lot to say for C, for example. And they're probably going to be kind of related anyways. So we can cut that way, for sure. Cut, you know, then there's only six things to write as opposed to almost 20. Mm -hmm. And that's only in the part two section. I, right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, does it have to be a survey? Like, can we just have this document, leave it as is, and just come to the table and use it as a talking point guide? Mm -hmm. Well, my sense of it is that our process involves having the survey that we share, a result that gets shared among the board that is a written result and then we come to the meeting. So without trying to look it all up, my sense is we do have to avoid being too informal given our own internal mm -hmm. policies and procedures. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a good thing to, to do and, and um, to do it with integrity uh, I think is, is why it becomes valuable. Um, so I wouldn't want to just use it as a set of talking points, but uh, I think it can be reduced in size, and, uh, and I'd be happy to be one of the people to look over it to see if there are things that stand out as, as obvious candidates for um, elimination. Great. Does anyone else want to help Peter? Otherwise, Say yes. <laughs> otherwise I can help him. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll join. You want to help him? Okay, so Jonathan and Peter will get that to us. Um, distribute self-evaluation, so we need to get that done by April 30th. We have a month. Well, we'll get it before then. Oh, we have to. The hard deadline is to distribute to the board by April yes. 30th. Yes. So you and Peter can think mm -hmm. of in the next couple weeks yeah. and then get it over to Angie that way. Because um, we would want to see it, and so then it has to get back on the next agenda. Okay. Is that a good, Peter? Sounds good. Okay, thank you for volunteering Trust and verify. to do that. <laughs> that's right. Trust. So that, that's all you need from us, right, Angie? We got the process, we're good. Okay. So that moves us to our last item, 14.1, much awaited facilities, plans, programs. So I'll ask uh, Vice President Lindsay Moss to come down and set this up for us. So, good evening, everyone, Board of Trustees. This, evening, um, thanks. <laughs> this presentation we were planning to do for a facilities retreat or all-day workshop. So, as we've mentioned at the last meeting, we're trying to break these pieces up into small chunks for us to go through with the board since we weren't able to fit in an all-day event talking about uh, facilities. So it's a little bit tough because we have a lot of meat to cover and it would have been nice to talk about it all in one day and understand all the pieces all, all at once. But due to scheduling, here we are. So who we have here tonight is Eric Middlestead. He's a fantastic assistant to me. I, he, he's just such an important part of my team even though he's not here on campus with us because I can pick up the phone and call him at the drop of a hat. Eric Middlestead has uh, been a consultant with his own company, Facilities Planning and Consulting Services, for 14 years. He's been in the community college system for 20 years in facilities and maintenance at various districts. He's currently the Associate Vice Chancellor at Kern Community College District for um, facilities and construction and planning. He's been there for three years. Kern Community District is Bakersfield, Porterville, Ridgecrest. It's three colleges and four centers. It's one of the, it is the largest district regionally. It goes all the way up to Mammoth and all the way down to Bakersfield. So he does a lot of driving and oversees a lot of different facilities there. Eric is really the go-to person. Anytime I go to any ACBO conference, anywhere I go, every CBO tells me, well, do you work with Eric? Because he knows everything about all the state processes. So he's a huge asset to have uh, to all of us. And today he's here to present to us the, the state ins and outs of all of the different reporting we have to do and how you obtain funds from the state. It's very complex. There's this fusion reporting system you'll hear him talk about that has just 
tons of level of detail about our facilities and all the state's community college facilities, and that's what the Chancellor's Office uses to review what we have going on here specifically. And um, another piece of uh, the presentation that he's going to talk about right now is all the different deadlines we have and all the different reports we have to present to the state every year. So we want to let the board know these are the things that we're doing that we have coming up. And the next one that's coming up that's very important is submitting our five-year construction and capital outlay proposals. Those are due typically in the summer. This year they're going to be due August 1st. And I would like to come and present that to the board again uh, in May and in June, two times. So we have a lot of time to talk about it and discuss it and go through it. So those are some big items that'll be coming towards the board soon in May and June. We'll talk about our five-year plan. If you'll recall last year, you can take a look. We, we talked about it in June and we just had one item. So he'll be talking about that whole process and how that looks. And I think I'll let him take it away. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I missed the first one, but it sounded like you guys had other plans with a big fire, so yeah. um, much, much more important than what we're going to talk about. Um, one of the things Lindsay mentioned, I always want to clear the air. If you, if you noticed, I'm a consultant for 14 years, and I have a day job as an associate vice chancellor, and how do I do that? Uh, I don't sleep. First thing is I, I don't sleep. Um, but I want to make sure we're clear that when I do my consulting, I'm on vacation from my day job. So I'm actually on vacation today to come here to present to you because sometimes that's a question. <clears throat> so I wanted to make sure we cover that. But what I do in my day job and night job are really the same thing. It's just for one district during the day and other districts at night, as I call it. It's, it's um, as you'll see, we have this magnificent database called Fusion. And uh, we're going to go into Fusion here talk about fusion, but it, it really houses everything we do in California Community College facilities. And we have more data than any other educational system uh, in California for sure. And it's just, so it's remarkable, but it allows us to do everything online. All of these plans are mostly online and there are a bunch of numbers. Um, I'm the trainer for the fusion database. So we, we also go out and train other folks, uh, architects, engineers, districts, district turnover to work in this fusion database. In the essence of time, because this was meant for your retreat, I'm gonna to try to speed through some of this, but certainly um, if you have questions, I wanna answer all your questions as well, and we can always come back. But it was, it's pretty lengthy, it is pretty comprehensive, so if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, the, we're, what many, many programs are um, used in the California Community Colleges, so we're gonna get into the fusion database on the next slide, but. We have an annual space inventory update, and it's due each year. We have an energy usage report, and it's due um, usually with the space inventory each year. We're going to go into each one of these in more detail. We have a scheduled maintenance five-year plan, and we also have these things called project funding proposals, which are individual projects that we use our scheduled maintenance money for, which is typically due on October 1st. Uh, we're going to go into a facilities assessments, which is a big database. It's not a report that's due, but it's assessment that are going to be provided by others. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Because you're actually getting your assessment of your entire campus or district done starting next week. There'll be some assessors here. So we'll go into that in a little more detail. And then the big one, as Lindsay mentioned, is the five-year construction plan. It's typically due when we wrote this. It was due on July 1st. Um, they given an extension this year with the call letter to be um, due on August 1st. Of all of these, that's the only one that is required to have board approval. So you may not have seen these others come before you for approvals because compliance-wise, they're not required for board approval. And within that five-year construction plan, we have these things called initial project proposals and final project proposals, and I'll refer to them as IPPs and FPPs. And those are the proposals to try to get state funding. Um, and we're going to go into different categories of those. Then we're going to talk a little bit about construction cost escalation due to inflation and how unique you are here and some of the models that are used and how they work. And then we'll go about moving forward what our next steps are. So Fusion Database, it, it actually the acronym start, stands for Facility Utilization Space Inventory Options Net. It was just a catchy phrase that was created in 2003. What most folks don't know, it's actually owned by the 72 districts. We each pay a fusion fee, and um, there's some committees that oversee this. It is currently housed at San Joaquin Delta, and it, they're getting ready to get bids to move it into the cloud. 
Um, we have a steering committee called the Fusion Steering Committee, which is a subcommittee of the ACBO Facilities Task Force. And the ACBO is the Association of Chief Business Officials, which Lindsay's one member of. And that Facilities Task Force is a subcommittee of the ACBO. So um, all of it is related to what's best for the district. So it's a representative group about the district owning this humongous database with all this data. We're currently underway with Fusion 2, and it's to make it a better planning tool. And one of the weaknesses of Fusion 1, thinking back to 2003, it was only Internet Explorer based. And so it doesn't work on iPads and iPhones and all of the things we've transitioned to. A huge task to move this entire database into a cross-browser platform. And of course, find all the enhancements with technology since then. So the committee's been working on it for well over a year. And we, Fusion is based on modules. When we talk about these plans, they're in different modules. So we're transitioning one module at a time to Fusion 2. And, um, okay, so the space inventory, it's, it's due once a year, um, typically the third Friday in October. And we have identified every square footage of our campus buildings and rooms. So this room is in that database, it's, it's square footage, it's, it's got a type of room, it's got a academic program or called a TOPS code, but for every room in the district, we, this is in the database. And if we think of Fusion as a tool that rolls up to the California Community College level, every district in the California Community College system is also in this database. So they are able to roll that data up, everything we're gonna talk about today, to help lobby for money, for money for needs, capital outlays, statewide bonds, um, but everything in this database rolls up. So as I mentioned, each room has a square footage, it's got a desk count, it's got a room type, um, and, and I'll show you a couple screenshots here of the space inventory. It contains all of the locations where we have instruction and whether we rent or own them. Um, you've had a comprehensive space inventory completed in 2014. What that means is every so often we bring in somebody else and this different set of eyes goes through and looks at everything. Typically it's updated once a year and once it's under control there's a handful of changes. Where you've done a renovation, where you've built a new building, and then some what I'll call maintenance and operations day-to-day -day changes where a classroom turns into a lab, a storage room turns into an office. All of those are updated annually each year. So you had a very good, fresh, comprehensive look in 2014. This is a summary shot of um, your square footage. We have three approved sites for your district, to the two centers and the city college. Um, the acronym ASF stands for, stands for assignable square feet and OGSF is outside gross square footage. OGSF is easy enough to think about. It's, it's the outside walls of your building, length times width, with a couple of criteria for overhang. Um, assignable are some of the um, spaces inside the building that are not things like bathrooms and custodial closets and mechanical rooms. And so it's just the wall thickness and those other uh, rooms that are the difference between the ASF and the GSF. And if you notice to the far right, we have a station count for currently reported desks, whether they're in an office or classroom or a lab. This data has all rolled up to this level. This is a screenshot of some of your buildings. Just wanted to kind of give you an overview. This is the next level down in the data. Well, we have every building, it's got a state number, the year it was built, if there was a last addition, outside gross square foot, assignable. The efficiency is really not efficiency, how we would measure space utilization. It's really just a ratio of ASF to GSF. And some people use that as a measure of efficiency. When you build a state building, they don't let you get too inefficient by this number, meaning really wide hallways or too many bathrooms and things like that. So it's really not the common term efficiency. How many rooms are in that building? How many desks are in that building? And the status um, A is active. The next level down is an actual building, and there's building level information, and you, as you can see, every single room. Now this is a Fusion 2 screenshot, so the layout is a little different. And as we move into the 20th century, we start using things like pencils and trash cans, where in Fusion 1, we use buttons like view and edit and add. So, for some folks, it's difficult because you go to one screen and you have a garbage can and another screen you have a delete button. But that's really just the, the low level stuff. But notice every room on this slide has a, a room number, an acronym, or a prefix and suffix, a room code type, and there's a whole slew of different codes. The academic program within it, how many desks, how many square feet, and the program um, type. Okay, so that and again, it's done every year and reported every year, 1st of October. 
So imagine um, that at the system level for California community colleges. And if you're building buildings with a local bond, then there's a lot of work updating that every year and adding those buildings in. Our next item, um, something that's due that's not in fusion, that some of us are pushing to get it in fusion, because it's really the only thing that is mandatorily due but not in fusion, is called an energy usage calculator. Um, back in the early 2000s, 2007, there was an energy policy established by the Board of Governors. And um, while it didn't have a lot of teeth in it, there were a lot of shoulds and um, there weren't shalls, there weren't musts. And so many districts have adopted this. But part of what this um, policy does is it asks districts to try to reduce 15% of their energy usage, and energy in this case is electricity and natural gas, by 15% compared to the baseline year. And they asked to do that by 2011. They went back to a baseline in 2001 because many districts had already taken the low-hanging fruit. They had already done a lot of energy conservation. So that's um, one of the criteria. And we submit a calculator each year showing that energy usage and compare it to the base year to see if we make our goal. Um, part of this policy also, when you have a state-funded capital project, we expect it to outperform. Title 24 is just the standard that runs all these buildings. Um, if it outperforms by 15% for new buildings or 10% for renovations, the state will actually give you 3% for construction on a renovation and 2% of the construction amount. So there is some teeth and some incentive behind it. It's not just a policy with no, no money. That's a significant amount. It doesn't seem like much, but if it was a $40 million building, 2% of that's a fair amount of money, or 3%. Um, I would like to, if I could stop here for just a minute, I want to congratulate you on having a LEED Platinum building. That is not easy, but also nor is it cheap. And so, you know, the state projects that we're about to talk about, they are not to that standard, so we couldn't expect to get state money and build something to the standard. So as you can see here, 2% and 3%, that's just to meet beyond Title 24. And it's not easy to get to Title 24, so getting beyond it is difficult. And so there's, there's some money here to help with that. Uh, another part of the policy was districts should pursue cost-effective, and I notice the word should, cost-effective on-site renewable energy, which most of us have by now. You know, this policy really could be used to update because most districts have got some sort of solar on their campuses. This is actually the energy usage calculator that was turned in last October for your district. If you were to cut to the chase and notice the far right corner, all of them are negative numbers in the out years, which is great. Um, a negative 31% last year compared to the baseline. So based on your usage, and it takes square footage into account as well, you've reduced 31% com compared to the first year. We also take, and I, I kind of help write the formulas for this and the policy, we take into consideration, if you notice, weeks of operation and, and, uh, for academic and total weeks. Because at the time this was built, there was a push for a year-round school. And we would know more usage, more, more student usage, more energy usage, right? So we tried to negate that down to total weeks of operation. And you notice there's a British thermal unit per gross square foot per week to negate that year-round schooling. Um, and it also takes the square footage from the space inventory. Because if you grow in buildings, you also grow in energy usage. So it tries to moot those two factors and give you a true comparison to baseline. They didn't set a standard here. They wanted the districts to compete against themselves because it's, uh, there's just no standard that could be put out there to compare Bakersfield, where it's 105 in the summer, to Santa Barbara, right? It's just because air conditioning is one of the major things for energy usage. So the goal was to get districts to compare and get better than themselves. Okay, so each district turns in one of these. So congratulations on a good report card. Um, another program that we do is called Scheduled Maintenance. It's a, there's a five-year schedule maintenance plan, and it comes along with these project funding proposals. It's due each year in October, um, the first year of the plan. It comes through the governor's budget. That's, that's one main thing. So therefore, it's subject to political process. Um, there's no state budget commitment for years two through five in the plan. So if you see a lot of money or no money out in the out years, it's not a commitment. It's meant to be a plan to help you plan. It's when you get your actual money that you have to uh, decide how to allocate that money. So we get a district allocation each year based on FTES, and again, the governor's budget. In 2017, um, your district received 757000 
the district can use that money for instructional equipment or scheduled maintenance projects. And in 2017, the district allocated 514,000 for scheduled maintenance and 243 for uh, instructional equipment. And we're gonna go in a little bit deeper here in just a minute. Once, once we identify the 514,000 for uh, projects, we actually have to build a project funding proposal for each one. And there's some criteria that we're gonna go into here. One thing I wanted to point out, this political process, it's in the governor's budget. Several years ago, this was a 50% match program. And uh, then we went dry for about four years during the recession. When it came back, it came back with Governor Brown with a lot of money, so much that districts couldn't afford to match it. So the legislation actually for the last three years has had no match requirement. Um, but before that, again, it was a 50% match. So the plan still shows a 50% match because they haven't really changed the policy. But the Fusion 2 database is going to be able to accommodate it where they can just check a box each year for the, the local match, if any. Um, there's five categories of, of types of scheduled maintenance. Um, the biggest thing about scheduled maintenance is it's meant to be a repair or replacement of an existing system, not new installation. So we can't go install new air conditioners in a building that doesn't have air conditioning, but we can replace and upgrade the air conditioners in that building. So it is scheduled maintenance to repair something that exists. Roofs are a big one. Um, air conditioning, probably one and number two. Um, also, one of the caveats that catches a lot of folks, and I say this because it's good to know so we can budget other funds for it because it doesn't mean these things don't need to be replaced. It means the state won't give you money for them are things that are called revenue generating facilities. Biggest one being parking lots. So we'll never get state money to rebuild or build a parking lot. They consider it, although I've never found a district yet that makes a profit from it, they consider it a revenue generating facility. So things like that, bookstores, um, student unions, health centers where you have a student fee, dorms, stadiums, we can't get state money for that even in the capital outlay or the scheduled maintenance area, okay? Um, the system-wide community college needs, they, as I mentioned with Fusion, that money, all those needs in the plan, it rolls up and the chancellor's office uses that to help lobby for more money. So when we see windfalls of scheduled maintenance money in governor's budgets, it's because we can prove it to the legislator that we have the need. Or if we're a K-12 or a CSU, they don't have this database to be able to roll it up from every district up to the top. And so it's very powerful in Sacramento because they know there is this, this database. Uh, the next scheduled maintenance plan and, five year, and PFPs, project funding proposals, will be due in October. Right now, you may have heard in the governor's proposed budget, I think there was $275 million. And going through the lobbying process, that may go up or down. And then once that budget is locked, July 1, then the districts will receive this FTES list and their allocation and then we go through the process we just went through to chop it up, decide how much is instructional equipment versus scheduled maintenance, and then build the projects. Then we actually go out and build the projects in real life. That takes on a life of its own because of, you know, you have students, and we try to, most districts will try to get around the students and do work when the students aren't around, which is not too, diff not too easy when you do things like storm drains and roof replacements and, air conditioning systems. This is an example of your scheduled maintenance plan, how you spent that 500,000 and change for last year. We have three projects that were on the list, and you can see um, air conditioning, sewer lines, and roof repairs on multiple buildings, and the total funds. Each year, this is legislated in, uh, for the time. In this year, there's two years to encumber the money, meaning let a contract, and two years to liquidate it, finish the contract. As I mentioned with that every year being legislated, the norm has been two years to contract and liquidate. That's pretty challenging when you think of, again, not being able to do work year round. Most folks try to wedge this into the summer, and now with school going longer in the summer school, it's difficult. It's difficult to do a roof or an air conditioning in a building. So only having two bites of the apple even in summer school is, is a challenge. So it's, the logistics of these are pretty, pretty difficult. At the next level, this is a screenshot of your five-year plan that's currently being built in the database. So as you can see, previous year's money that was allocated for scheduled maintenance, and um, the, next, the current year, and then the next four years. And again, this won't be due till October, so it will be refined 
um, when projects are identified in the plan, but remembering the plan is not a commitment, it's, it's a plan. So as we roll into the 1819 year, that 725 that was in plan will be the starting point when you receive the governor's money to decide what to do. And simply some of those projects can be delayed. New projects with a higher priority can be inserted there. And then one year will be blank on the end to get that five year plan adjusted. Okay. This is a big one, the facilities assessment. Um, as I mentioned, Next week, you're going to have these three assessors here, and we'll talk about that. Every three to five years, these assessors from the California Community College Foundation will come to your campus, and they will look in every room of your district. Um, coincidentally, that's set for Monday. They go through, and they have this database that feeds information to Fusion that's bigger than Fusion. Um, and they, it's based on two things. Um, it's based on the life of a building and deficiencies that are seen in a building. So as they look into this room, they may be looking for peeling paint or torn carpet. Um, but as they also look at the age of this building or this room, there's life cycles that these systems are expected to live. So if this building is 40 years old and the carpet hasn't been replaced, then it's going to trigger the carpet to be replaced because it's outlived its useful life based on being 40 years old. So there's two different types of deficiencies within this database. Um, it's paid for completely by the districts in their annual fusion maintenance fee. Each, as I mentioned, the districts own fusion. Every district pays a fee every year, and that fee goes to pay for the assessors and all of the foundation employees that work behind the scenes on the fusion database. Um, there's this thing that you'll hear repetitively. It's called a FCI, a Facilities Condition Index. And an FCI is the percent of the cost divided into the um, cost to replace. So cost of repairs divided into the cost to replace. So if we have 100% FCI, it means it's going to cost 100% of the replacement value to repair whatever it is we're talking about. There's an FCI established for your district, for your campuses, each campus individually, and your buildings. And we're going to look at a couple of those at the summary level. But it's a very big database. And as I mentioned, it, um, it's based on two things. Has something outlived its useful life and or is something actually deficient. A um, couple things about this assessment, it doesn't take code, things like code upgrades or program changes, nor does it look at the site. It simply looks at the replacement value of a building with the same building. And it's using a, a national database called RS Means, so it's, um, it's all formula driven. So when I see a number in here, it's not that that number is the exact number, it's a mathematical formula, but it gets you in the ballpark. Um, it does definitely get you in the ballpark. Chancellor's office also uses this data to help lobby for more schedule maintenance money at the, at the governor's level, because again, we can roll all this up, we can come down to the penny with this model of deficiencies that are known. No other system out there as a system can do this, so it's very powerful. Uh, some boards of trustees will use this data as well to help justify their needs for part of a local bond initiative. My, my district just passed a half a billion dollar bond. They made sure that we did this right before because what better data than a third party independent that looks at the condition of your spaces to justify your needs for repairs or replacement. So it is a good piece of, of data. This is just a, a partial screenshot and what I did here is I took the database and tried to put some of the higher numbers. So as you can see, the name of the building, and again, fed from Fusion, all of these square footages and rooms rolled up into the building level, um, and its age, and the cost model is giving it a cost per square foot to rebuild that building. So if I just stay with the administration building for a minute, it's got a 62% FCI, which means it's, it's pretty well used up. 60%, it will cost 62% of what the model says is the replacement value of the building at 34 million, and it would cost 21 million to repair it. Now, I also want to tell you, remember, they come every three years. So this data was updated three years ago, three to four years ago. In about three months, you will, or two months maybe, you will have updated as of March 26th information in this database, and it'll be automatically updated. Mm -hmm. So as we use this as one piece of data, or districts use this as one piece of data to help them make decisions on projects. Um, no projects come from one source. There's not a single data source. So 
We might see things like today it's raining. If you had a roof leaking, that's one piece of data. You might see in here that that roof is old. Many pieces of data help districts make decisions on, re on replacing something. Um, this is, again, it's one of them. It's very helpful. Most places in the industry say they start looking at renovation around 40 to 50 percent. They start looking at replacement around 60, 70, 80 percent. Really, a lot of it depends on the age of the building. Um, we can, like, for example, the administration building, and I know nothing about it other than the numbers here. It's very hard to take a building that was built in 1939 and compare it to a brand new building in 2018. Right, we can refresh it, we can refresh it, but when you get down to the structural base of the system, you can't remove that structure, or you are down to replacing the building. So sometimes you, it helps boards, decision makers, make informed decisions on should we replace that building, should we repair that building, or do we have the money to do either? And perhaps we need to look at some other sources of funding to help <coughs> us replace it. This is all helping lead up to that capital outlay discussion on can we get state money for this, or should we try to get local money for this? But it helps, again, identify the, the needs. One step lower than that is the administration building and actual deficiencies. So if we look here in, um, at the building level, carpet that's damaged or failing, meaning the assessor saw it and they saw rips and tears or really bad stains, it was $942,000 worth. There is a lower level than this, which we're going to look at in a minute. It gets down to the room level. Um, but you can see all of those that are damaged or failing were a visual look. The ones that say outlived its useful life are based on age. I always like to point to one if we can see it there. Air conditioning anywhere? Mm -hmm. A lot of times air conditioning will say it's outlived its useful life. And folks go, yeah, but it's working. I go, yeah, but when's it going to die? It's going to die when you're using it on the 4th of July. Right? And so this helps in the predictive replacement of things that are just, industry standard says something lasts 30 years. If it's been 35, it's a pretty good indicator that pretty soon it's going to go. So we can help you plan some of your uh, budgets to repair. And as you can see, just in this building alone, it's 13.7 million. And in the upper right, I just put a screenshot of the summary level of how they get to that 13.7 um, with an additional cost to equal the 21 million. As I mentioned, RS Means is a, is a national database. So as they were building this, the people that know a lot more than me about all these numbers, they said, we have to add on a California factor. Because other states don't have things that we have in California, like prevailing wage. I mean, they have a Davis-Bacon, but it's different in California. Um, project labor agreements. I mean, there's a lots of things that add in. So they have this additional cost, as they call it. It comes up with a re total replacement value, a repair value, I'm sorry, over replacement value. And that's how mathematically it gets to 62%. Wanted want to just show you a screenshot of all of those systems. I would also tell you never depend that every one of those is exactly that amount. There's lots of things that go into these numbers. It's a mathematical model, and it again was close at a national level or a state level. It's not unique to Santa Barbara. It's not regional based. It's not zip code based. It's it's state-based, okay? So some folks, I tested this once at one of my districts and I did a roof and I thought I did it just like the database and I was within 10% when I actually got a bid, which is the other piece. When you have a bidding climate, competition is good and bad. I mean, if everybody's, you can't control the bid climate, I guess is what I'm saying, okay? This is an actual deficiency. So we are now down to the system level of that same administration <coughs> building. And again, here is that mechanical system I was referring to. Well, you can see something that, um, and there's some data below it on the, uh, goes into the cost, but you can see to the level of granularity that this database gets to. It actually tells you in the middle right, if I can use this, here, it tells you how the pathway just to get to this room, right? It's at the California Community College level, this district, this campus, this administration building, and the deficiency level. Now, there could be other deficiencies would actually get to the room level. Um, when it was created, and here you can see when the assessment happened last, 2014, and the assessor that was here at the time. And then it gets into all of the costing. So for every deficiency that we've seen in this database, there is what I'll call a, a, a single page printout of that deficiency and how the money was calculated and what the problem is. In this case, we can say it's outlived its useful life, which means it's still working, 
but it's by, by statistical measures, it's due to go anytime. Okay. We have another one. Here's our big plan that Lindsay was referring to, the five-year construction plan. And this is an annual plan of current and future capital outlay projects and needs, regardless of the funding source. So state funding, local funding, grant funding, every project basically over 656,000 should be in here. That's not a scheduled maintenance project. Um, a big piece is it contains enrollment projections from the chancellor's office, and those are subdivided by the district based on actual enrollment patterns. So again, you can see how granular we get in this database when we have a room type, like a classroom, we also get down to how many students were enrolled in the classrooms. We don't get down to the room level here, but we get down to the category level, and I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But it's pretty granular stuff. When we put those enrollments into the five-year plan, we get this thing spit out called, oh shoot, uh, capacity load ratio. And it's the state's space utilization metric. It's basically dividing up the square footage of a given area, let's say a classroom, by the enrollments that we say are in those classrooms at the campus level, and it's determining by a state Title V standard whether we're using the lecture space on our campus efficiently or not. And if we are overusing it, we can qualify for some state money. So the, the metric here um, is that it's a competitive process to get this state money. Um, the metric is 100% capacity load ratio is standard. Anything lower than that is good. It's an inverse number, so I, I tell folks, think of it as golf. 100 is your par, and anything over that's bad. Right? The, the higher it gets, the worse it is. So if you see in a minute a capacity load ratio of, <coughs> sorry, my, my watch is ringing. A capacity load ratio of um, 125, that's bad. And capacity load ratio of 80, that's good. It means you need more capacity to get to 100% in that category. And you can compete for state funding um, based on these capacity load ratios. So as we, um, it's a rigorous qualification and competitive process to get these IPPs and FPPs funded, right? Very, very difficult. So except for safety projects, um, the cap load ratio must be at 100 or less, okay? Our conceptual projects, we're talking about specifically IPPs and FPPs now. Um, a project, if we're gonna try to get state money, starts out as an IPP, and we submit it along with your five-year plan. So when that plan comes before the board, it may list one project that is an IPP. Um, and that, that IPP goes along with the plan, and um, it's looking to, to build an, oh shoot, I did it again. It's looking to build a new facility or renovate an existing facility. And the chancellor's office will, will measure it based on its academic argument and these capacity load ratios to see if they're at or below 100%. If it's below that, generally the IPP is gonna be approved. It doesn't commit the district to anything. It's the precursor. As we talk about an FPP in a minute, they're expensive. And so this system is set up to say, we've, we wanna float a concept out to the chancellor's office. And so we don't have to spend a lot of money if they don't like that concept at the next phase. So there's not a commitment on the district's end or the chancellor's office end when we submit an IPP. Um, if it's approved, it can be updated into an FPP the following year. Just last week, the chancellor's office sent out their letter saying, do your five-year plan, it's due August 1st, and here's a list of approved IPPs that could be made into FPPs should the district choose. One thing that's a little um, awkward here is we're trying to do things now. If we were gonna do an FPP this year, just to use an example, we're trying to do that now to get in the governor's 2020, 2021 budget. So it's that far in the future. So at any given time, we're working in three different, I'll call them buckets of fiscal years, buckets of budget in the governor's office. You've all seen they're working on the 1819 governor's budget. In just a minute, I'm gonna show you what was the Board of Governors spending plan for 1819. They're processing the 1920 um, bucket FPPs while we may be producing the 2021 FPPs. So they're always, some are already in motion, some, and there's a, a year before that where we're building them. The 1718s are being built right now. That was three years ago. So it's way in the future, which is why we have these enrollment projections. We're trying to project how many students are going to be in our classrooms in lecture and laboratories to build buildings so they're ready for those students when they appear. And so it's a pretty elaborate formula. Um, pretty, pretty elaborate. 
Once we go through the IPP and the FPP the following year, the FPP has to justify a strong educational argument. Also has to have capacity load ratios within 100, except for safety projects, a whole different category for safety. Then the project's actually going to compete on an objective points basis with other community colleges system-wide. Each project has a, cap a capability of scoring 200 points. So as you see through this whole process, once we get to that final piece, we'll, we're going to go through the scoring matrix and it says, how many points do we score? And at the end of the day, in any category, they say, how much money's in this bucket of money? And the score of all the projects, and they just draw a line. And those above the line are not funded, and those below the line are funded. Except for, I will say, the, the legislative process, the lobbying process. We're trying to minimize that, but it seems to be happening more as the governor's budget has, isn't approving the Board of Governors list. Okay? So 200 points. We're going to get a little deeper into the points and categories in just a minute. This is just kind of a picture that shows planning. Planning's ongoing. It's just secular. You know, where you can see all of the steps of a state-funded project. Um, and the state-funded project is part of a five-year plan. The five-year plan is driven by enrollments and space from the space inventory. So everything ties together. And that's what we're trying to depict here of, of it. It's cyclical, uh, but also let you to see how many steps there are to a state-funded project. At each one of those steps, there's chancellor's office approval. Um, there, you know, there's certain things you can and can't do. There's not much flexibility. And we're putting in proposals for four and five years down the road. So it's, it is a very rigid process. There's six categories of state-funded projects. Category A are those that are safety-related. Um, and there's a big criteria for safety. Category B is to increase instructional capacity. So that's an academic building, like a new science building or a, um, a new math building. Category C modernizes instructional space. Uh, category D is this, pro this process called it's a complete campus. And there's a certain set of buildings that don't have this capacity load ratio metric, but they're used for instruction. And those are like theaters, child development centers, um, and gymnasiums. And then category E and F are for non-instructional buildings like student services. A new student service building is an E. Um, a modernization of a student service building is an F. Except for category A, all of these projects get a score and they objectively compete against other districts. We're going to go in through category A in just a minute. This is how the funding works. You've all heard of Proposition 51. It was $2 billion for California community colleges. When they identify a certain amount of money in a given year, 50% of that money is going to go into the safety projects, unless there aren't that many safety projects requested. And they don't get a score. They're either in or they're out. They don't require a local contribution, which we'll go over in a minute, but they're either in or out. Of the 50% that's left, academic growth is still at the top, and it gets 50% of the 50%. And the academic modernization is 25%. And you can see category D, E, and F. So as you get further away from instruction, you get less money. The whole goal of this model was to keep safety first and then instruction second. This model, funding model, may or may not change with the student enrollment funding model, right? That's going to more student success based because there's not a lot of growth in the system. But facilities always follow education. They don't drive the education. So I would say, depending on what that model is, the, the facilities task force would probably evaluate this model to make sure it lines up with the, um, the, f the next funding model. But we're currently under this chase the growth, chase the growth for buildings. Um, and you can see that we need a building to still, even with online, we need a building to, for the students to learn in. OK, so here is a um, scoring criteria for category B and E. Those are those growth projects. If you go down to the box at the bottom as a summary, but notice there's 200 points. Um, and the bottom one is a local contribution. So in every category we have, with the exception of safety, a district can choose to match the project. And we get up to 50 points out of 200 points for a local match. Why that's important is if a district doesn't have any money to locally match, and you're competing against a district that does have money to locally match, you're already 50 points down. <coughs> and so it's a really difficult process. Well, I used to call it, why I got pretty good at this, I used to call myself a three-legged dog in a four-legged dog race. And I had to beat those other dogs because they had this fourth leg and I didn't have it. So I had to be very good at these other categories. Um, 
So we'll, let's talk about them. We get 50 points, up to 50 for enrollment growth. And in this little example, this is in a, something called WISH, Weekly Student Contact Hours. So those enrollments that come from the chancellor's office and get divided up, um, we get rewarded here if we have more growth projected. The more growth that means the more need. So this particular one um, got 50 points. They look at your existing space inventory and they say, how bad are those capacity load ratios in the biggest square footage of your project? The worse they are, the more you get rewarded because again, it shows need for space. And then of the square footage change, basically how much of it applies is, um, there's a criteria behind it, but how much supports the academics? And then this local match. Okay, so if we were going for a B or E, sometimes we say it's not a good project. It, it, it has a good argument, but it doesn't have a good score. And you have to make an informed decision on do we invest in an FPP that's pretty expensive if let's say this score was 45. Next category for uh, C and F, modernizations of instructional and non-instructional spaces, a modernization is a different criteria. Um, it goes a lot on the age of the building. And at a certain point, they were trying to weave in that uh, facilities cost index, the condition of the building. But it's not in the criteria now. But there's discussions on it. So you really get rewarded. And notice there's only three categories here. You get rewarded for the older your building is. You can get up to 120 out of those 200 points um, for how old your building is. So a 1939 building is going to score a lot of points. Basically, at 65 years, the, um, it's determined to be an old building, and it gets 120 points. So when we think of an old building that's 20 years old, that's a baby in the, in the capital outlay game. Um, if there's vacant space in that building, you're going to get rewarded points to activate that vacant space. And then again, local contribution of 50 points. So in this case, this project had zero local match. So it's an 82-point project. The category D is a different animal altogether because it's things that they call it a complete campus. And there's many districts or colleges that don't have some things. So you get rewarded based on the age of the site and something you don't have, like uh, a gymnasium. There are many colleges out there don't have a gym or a theater. and so. Based on how long you went without a gym or theater, you get points. And then depending on the academic programs that are going to be new because of that building, you get some points. And then the project design, um, if, if you have maybe a program but it's in portables, temporary facilities, then you get more points. And then again, a local contribution. So you can see in this case, this project is pretty old. It's got a lot of program need and a lot of the de um, design need because maybe they're in temporaries but no local contribution. So we've got 119 out of 200 points. Those capacity load ratios that we were talking about earlier, there we, we just made a little cutout for you to review. Um, in the 2018-19 year, which is still a projection, right, but it's just around the corner, the, the campus, Santa Barbara City, is uh, proposed to have 110 in, in lecture, 120 in lab, 90 in office. So this one's below the standard, meaning you need space here. And these are above. But notice what happens going out if we just look at la, uh, lecture. We're 10% over, and it starts going down, not because we're building any buildings, but we're going up in enrollments. So remember, it's a ratio. So as our enrollment, our student enrollment counts, they basically say, hey, out here, we're going to be short of space. And those state projects occupy out here. This is what, when we're looking for state money, they're looking when that building gets occupied so students can use it. So they're looking out here. So you, this kind of paints a good picture that if we were looking for growth, it makes sense, right? We're predicted to have not enough space for our students in this year, so we could put in some, for some state funding. Now, there's a lot behind it. It may not be a lot of square footage, but it, it, it paints a really good picture of where you are today and how it gets into a more difficult situation out in the future to help predict the needs. We have screenshots of these for each of the three campuses. The Wake Center and the Shot are both still official centers. So all this data that we're talking about, we do at times three. Um, it's, it's also not unrealistic or unusual to have really high capacity load ratios in small centers. They just need a certain amount to operate. And some of these standards are pretty high. Uh, for example, a lecture room at a small campus is supposed to have classes in it 48 hours a week. And it's supposed to have a chair, a desk, every 15 square feet. And it's supposed to be filled two-thirds, 
And that's a pretty high bar for a big college, let alone a small center. But you've got to have some lecture room. So it's not uncharacteristic to have cap loads this high. That's why many of your centers are locally funded. Your next building as a center is locally funded because we just can't, under the current criteria, we can't compete to grow um, until we use those spaces much better, which is difficult for small centers. <coughs> Shot campus, real similar, um, but its lab is low. So it probably has, this could be the difference of two extra classrooms by the metric in a campus this size, but it's got a high capacity load ratio in lecture, low in lab and office. So sometimes we look for growth projects that would only have lab and office space in it. And we can do that by saying we're overbuilt in lecture, but we need labs and offices. Can state, can we get a project for just labs and offices? Mm. Okay. There's also a criteria I should mention here because it does pertain to you. The criteria to get a center is 500 FTES, and then there's more money when you hit 1,000. Well, the reverse happens as well for capital outlay. If you fall below 500, they don't take away your center status, but they take away your ability to compete for capital outlay until we get above, back above the 500. And I think that happened in one of your projects a few years back. Uh, possible funding, state funding opportunities. Right now, you have one in the queue. That's category A, so remember it's the safety one. And it was an FPP that was submitted. Um, it was tentatively approved, and it's in the governor's 2019-2020 spending plan. So it's, it's more about safety. It's not about growth. Um, there's seismic issues with the building. There's been an engineer that said there's seismic issues with the building. Went through the rigorous process, and the state has agreed with you, and it is currently sitting in the governor's 2019-20 spending plan. Um, the student services renovation was just one we thought we would throw up there. It's a creative one. Um, an IPP could be submitted. It's not in your plan now. It was in a year or two ago and it was pulled out. It could be submitted in 2018 for funding, again, would be in 2021-22, because an FPP this year would be in 2020, 2021. So an IPP is even further out in the future. It's um, not a lot of competition in this F category where student services are renovated. But you have a unique situation here where your current student service building has a lot of overhang. And that overhang counts as half the square footage of the gross. And you have student services in portable buildings. So we can actually make a modernization project by demolishing the portables and building the space back in that overhang and not growing the envelope of the building. And so it could be a very creative way to get a modernization project in a student services building. So Eric, what you're referring to is the, is the uh, Hall, the hallway, I guess, on the outside of the building that yeah. goes around. Yeah, yeah. when That's you great. have what's called overhang, any, any overhang, that counts as half the square footage in that efficiency ratio. Well, a modernization project says you can't grow the envelope of the building. So we wouldn't be growing the envelope of the building. We'd be putting other space in it, making the building more efficient in the state's terms. Getting rid of temporary portables, which is also a good thing. Consoli oh, sorry consolidating student services as well, which is also a good thing. So you can see how that could start framing up to be a strong argument. One-stop shops, scattered uh, programs, inefficient portables, inefficient building. And it could be a great candidate with or without state funding, I'm sorry, local funding, just depends on how it would all play out. So we just wanted to mention those, one that's in your plan now and one that could be. This, at the time, was a draft 2018-19 spending plan. So each year the spending plan gets put together by the chancellor's office, goes through their board of governors, the board of governors approves them, and it gets sent on to the legislature and on to the governor. And it's trying to get into the governor's 18-19 plan. The governor rejected this plan, and he approved, I believe, five projects in his January 10 proposed budget. So what's happening now is an ongoing effort to lobby by districts to get their projects that were bumped out of this year back into this year. And we won't know until the May revise and the July budget. Last year that happened, and there were uh, 15 projects that got rejected. No, I'm sorry, there were 24 projects that got rejected and ended up being 15 approved. So originally he approved four, and it ended up being 15 approved. Some of those that didn't get approved got bumped into this year. Those that would be not approved in this year would get bumped to 2019, but every year they have to recompete. So you're not just in a pipeline and you stay in a pipeline, you get rejected, then you have to recompete with a new group. 
And so every year, it's a zero base budget. As I mentioned earlier, Prop 51 is what's funding this. And you can see in this funding year, the total state amount was 811 of that 2 billion. Uh, but again, only five are in that list. And notice, these are the ones that were in 2017, 18, and they're continuing, so they need more money. We, we have um, four phases in a project. Two phases of drawings, construction, and an equipment phase. So these started their drawing phase in 17, 18. These are the new projects, and here are the A projects. So if we were looking at a draft of a 1920, your project would be under this A. And we have the growth, the B, the C, the D. So quick pop quiz, what don't we see here? Uh, e and F. Yeah. <laughs> right? It takes a sharp eye to see that. This is the whole page. This is the whole plan. So uh, some of these, again, are being moved. Some are being lobbied to stay there. We won't know until we see the governor's budget, which is why it's difficult in the 1920 plan, because those could be bumped and recompeting with the 1920 that's going to the Board of Governors for their July meeting for approval. There's a lot of talk based on the new governor coming in that all, they all support Prop 51. Um, next January, we'll, we'll know for sure. Right? We'll have a new budget. We'll have a new governor. Okay, so I just want to see, kind of show you how the process works in Sacramento. So we're going to move on to another topic now about escalation. Um, escalation is a big topic across California. Um, how, I was asked, how do you plan for escalation costs for future capital, future capital outlay? One is um, we can predict inflation at an assumed rate from the beginning of a project based on the project schedule. So everybody talks about the cost of the midpoint of construction. How much is it going to go up? And there's different models, but the chancellor's office uses 5% per year. And then every year that it gets closer to the project, they take away 12 months of 5% projected and put in the actual. One thing worth mentioning here is the actual that the chancellor's office uses is a state number. It comes from a state database. It's not regionally based. So we all know that there are lots of pockets in there that are regionally based. Um, Santa Barbara being one. Southern California is different than Bakersfield. But they, they um, set the inflation rate at 5% and true it up. I can tell you last year as they trued it up, inflation statewide went up 3.5%. So projects in the queue actually went down a percent and a half. But the model is set there so if it does go up to 10%, they're compensating districts for it while they wait for that governor's funding. So that's the um, true up rate versus reality is done each year. Um, what I would always recommend is if you're sensitive to escalation, you get more project cost estimates more often. Um, sometimes it's what there's a term called scope creep, not inflation. We're going to build a building with 20,000 square feet, and the next round is 22,000 square feet, and 24,000. We always find more things we want. That's going to cost money as well as inflation. But the main thing here is the more you know sooner, the more you can try to budget for it, reduce it, value engineer it before it's too late. So I would always recommend if you're sensitive on escalation, do more estimates to know where you're at. You don't want to just have it on bid day and go, surprise. You want, to, you want to at least predict it. Now, sometimes the estimates early on are bad news, and we go, okay, what are we going to do? We're predicted to be $4 million over. Are we going to start saving money to pay the four? Are we going to value engineer the heck out of it before these systems are in? I will also say the bad news in this, you've set a goal for lead buildings. That plays into this number as well. And so sometimes you have to make the hard decisions. Are we going to stick with our standards, but we know that costs a lot of money, and inflation is just part of it. So... Sometimes we have to devalue our buildings, especially state-funded ones, because what's not here yet is the state does not pay for over-budget projects. It's expected that the district covers that difference. So that hurts some districts. Uh, this, as we were putting this presentation together, so it's a bit dated, was before the fire. It had, uh, it's a national one, and it was showing the inflation rate for Los Angeles. So it was the closest thing to you, so we thought we'd pick it out so you could just see it. It was being predicted at 7% um, in the Los Angeles area. As I mentioned, the state was forecasting theirs at 5%, and the actual state number was 3.5. So again, state number versus regional number. And you could even subdivide your region. It might be into zip codes, because I know it is, it is unique here when it comes into escalation. So it's something you've got to prepare for it, because it's, it's a real thing. Moving forward, um, 
Lindsay stole my thunder under this slide, so thanks, Lindsay. She wanted to let you know, and she, she has harped on me ever since, I want my board to know what we're doing. I want my board to know what we're doing. So this is what we're doing in the next year. This is what you're doing. Um, much of it is on your own. Much of it was outside help. Some of it's paid for in the assessments. Next week, you're getting your assessment, March 26th. Those assessors will be here for probably a week. Two months from now, you'll have that report in Fusion. Um, your five-year construction plan, as Lindsay mentioned, July 1 is, has been extended to August 1. She plans to bring it to you for two readings. Um, it's going to have enrollments in it. It's going to have a ton of numbers, and it may or may not have projects based on um, the district's recommendation to you and your input to them. Right now, I believe it's got the physical education project only in it. Um, the scheduled maintenance five-year plan and those project funding proposals, they're due to the state on October 1st. And again, not knowing how much money's in that bucket yet, once the governor's budget's signed, that starts that process based on the needs identified in the plan and all of the other information that um, the facilities and business services department has. And then the space inventory due to third Friday in October, that will be updated at the same time that energy usage calculator is due. Um, that the energy usage calculator is always after the fiscal year, so it it's goes back to 1718, current usage. With that, we'll open it up to any questions, and please don't ask me to start from the beginning of review. <laughs> Sorry I had to rush through that, but it was meant to really dig in deeper at every phase to answer your questions. You can see it's a very comprehensive system, um, all except for the energy calculator in this Fusion database. Yes, sir. I'm really glad that you did this, but I'm also glad that there's not going to be any true-false exam uh, of what <laughs> you just said. Um, my question focuses on the, the give and take of price estimates for a given building where there's local matching fund, funding required. Um, is, there any, is, is there a process of negotiating? Let's say they come forward with a, a no because there isn't sufficient local funding included in the original proposal. Can we then go back and say, okay, we'll increase the local funding? Yes and no. How's that? No, not that year. You would be rejected. Yes, the next year you have an opportunity to resubmit it. So it's a statewide policy. Obviously, every district would be out there starting with zero and negotiating their way up based on their right. bank account. Sure. So what they do is they line them up in that bucket, that silo of money, and then they draw the line. And those that aren't in there, they don't reject them completely. They just reject them as an FPP, and they take them back to an IPP approved. And the next year, the district can reassess whether they want to add more local money, or sometimes their situation changes because their enrollments may have been projected to go up, which adds more points. But it is, on the first crack, it's, a, it's once it's submitted, we can't, we can't negotiate it. Okay. And the second question, when, when you replace a building uh, and there's, there's some kind of quid pro quo, you, you tear one down and you put another, is, is the next building that you build, must it be exactly the same footprint or can it be expanded? Um, depends on the category. Let's, let's talk about your physical education building. It's a safety project. The goal that the state looks at is it's the least cost to put back exactly what was there. But exactly is not the same look. It's the same square footage. So let's just say it was a 40,000 square foot gymnasium, mm -hmm. had 2,000 square foot of offices and one classroom. That's what you put back. If it was more cost effective to modernize it, the state in that safety project would say you only get to modernize it to mitigate your safety issues. Sometimes, and I believe in your case was the case, the engineering record said it was going to be more cost effective to actually drop it and replace it, but that doesn't give us the opportunity to grow it. So it was really penciled out and the chancellor's office supported it that it was more cost effective to replace it than renovate it. Um, other projects are different. A growth project could re renovate and expand a building, with the expansion being based on the enrollment growth potential. And so since it's in a growth category, you can grow the square footage. A modernization can't. So in the, ca in the case of the student service building we were talking about, we can't grow beyond the envelope of the building with the exception of code needs, new codes like an elevator room or bigger bathrooms. They hold you to that envelope. 
So it really is understanding the criteria of each category and saying where does your project fit in that criteria. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So for the student services renovation, since you said that's something we might you know, have a good opening on, what counts as renovation? Like if, because I know we heard last time that that building is structured like a library and it's not as conducive for student services. Could we tear the entire part, tear it apart from the inside and rebuild from the inside, but keep the outer shell and count that as a renovation? Yes. Good, good question. Uh, um, yes, the short answer is yes. We're, we're held by these categories of cap load ratios and the envelope of the building. Mm -hmm. So we can renovate it. One of the things they reward is renovating for programmatic needs. Mm -hmm. So let's say, remember, we were overbuilt in lecture. And let's just say it had some lecture in it. We can say, OK, state, we're going to get more efficient. We're not going to put lecture back. We're going to take lecture out. And we have a need in lab or student services, which are offices. We're going to put more of those in. So we have to stay within that balance of each category's capacity load ratio and the envelope of the building. Mm -hmm. So in our creative case, the envelope of the building can also fit more square footage from those portables. So mathematically, it works. Mm -hmm. um, one point worth noting is the cost factor is formula driven. So every one of those categories gets a different dollar amount from the state. And in a renovation, they give us 75% of the new dollar. So let's just say if they gave us $600 a square foot to build a, a math lab, they'll give us 75% of that to renovate a math lab okay. or a classroom. But it is formula driven. Okay? Thank you. That was a good question. Dr. Beebe, did you have a question? What's So Eric, you know, I saw that you've got a lot of these, or the state has a lot of the, the formulas based on or predicated on growth. We're not looking to grow here. So we don't get the points for that, or we just, what, what happens when we're in that kind of situation, which many colleges are in the state, as you know. Yes, so what happens is once we evaluate, you're not going to grow based on the numbers, even if you wanted to grow, we shift to can we modernize our buildings. And so that's why I wanted to show you all the categories. And then when you get into modernization, you still maybe have a, um, a big wall to climb with the local contribution piece. Right? So let's say we have a student service building as an example, and if we could have a really good argument, we still have to beat out the competition. And so sometimes the, the score is important as well. So, but many districts where they're faced with, uh, with growth challenges and want state money, then they're forced into the modernization mm -hmm. game. And then if they have an evaluation that they don't have any old buildings that qualify, then they don't get any cap outlay. Sometimes they're looking for safety projects uh, because that's the only strategy that can be used. But it, you really look at all of them. And a lot of it is in support of your educational master plan and your facilities master plan. If your ed plan says we're not growing, then we would be shifting to modernization with, its, with state money or local money, right? And sometimes it's more cost effective based on what we saw to demolish and replace a building than it is to renovate a building mm -hmm. based on the age. So that's why I mentioned when you make management decisions on your facilities, you're not looking at one piece of data. You're looking at a whole aggregate. And then you're helping the board come to an informed decision. Gotcha. Um, Thank you for your PowerPoint. Your idea of a vacation is not mine, but <laughs> we're glad to have you here. And um, I just wanted to ask a few questions and mention history that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I've been on the board for about seven and a half years now. Um, we have had a project or projects that went way over budget, um, state funded. That was a painful experience. Um, Garvin Theater is the, the one that comes to mind. Um, so whenever the state doesn't pick up the over budget, that's a scary thing for us. Um, we also, I think, historically, I know, have not had this presentation. We have not seen IPPs. We have not seen... Um, FPPs. FPP. And had I seen them, I would not necessarily have said we should go ahead. Um, and I wish we had seen them. But given where we are now, I have concerns that we have made a recommendation to the state that we proceed in a particular way. And now we're kind of playing catch up with wonderful work by, by Lindsay et al. 
in putting together the facility master plan and figuring out where we are. Um, and at the same time, we're facing a system that, as you describe it, I think, was designed to chase growth. And um, personally, I'm fiscally fairly conservative, not other subjects perhaps, but fiscally. So if I look at our systems, I think more in terms of facility, of sustainability, of taking care of what we have rather than tearing it down um, and trying to build something new just to get state money. Because if my um, house had plumbing and electrical and air conditioning problems, I wouldn't tear it down and replace it for that reason. I would fix those items. So first level question would be, um, the maintenance money. I think what you're saying is we get an, uh, an amount that is FTES based. Is there any mechanism for asking for a maintenance project? And I saw in the 1819 spending plan, for example, that San Francisco has what's described as a utility infrastructure replacement. So when we got our at our previous meeting, we had a rundown on all the buildings. Um, that's in the top one there. Okay, up here. Uh, Sorry. Category A, I believe. Um, or no, continuing yes. projects, Cate excuse me. Continu continuing projects. Right, but notice it's a category A, which is important. Um, safety. safety. Okay. Which means they have things like fire alarms, things okay. where people are in danger. Okay. Well, um, that may answer my question, that you have to move that into a category yes. in order to ask for the money. You can't ask for deferred maintenance money. No, the deferred Never. maintenance money now, uh, several years ago it used to be a merit-based grant funded. We, we have more need than the other guy, give us the money. They changed that model with SB 231, the new funding model several years ago, um, to adopt it to a more of a FTES driven. So it's a big bucket of money divided by everybody's FTES and you get a percentage. Okay. So when I learned from the review that we had last time of, of our, the condition of our buildings, what, instead of thinking about the issues in terms of buildings, I started thinking about them in terms of systems. And, you know, like across the board, we seem to have HVAC problems, plumbing problems, probably electrical problems. Those are, can they be made into a project um, that fits any of these categories that make sense and allow us to basically play catch up on the deferred maintenance we haven't done? Yes, you can. I think you can see though from the one sheet where we have deficiencies, we're talking millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If we notice here, these repair costs and yeah, the, the scheduled maintenance is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're just, there's never enough at any district to use state schedule maintenance money to get you whole. Um, one of the things also with a lot of these we have to understand is in your example of uh, our house, or I use my car, absolutely when it's something that is the most cost effective, we fix it. And when it's not the most cost effective, we replace it. So cars last about seven years, eight years, right? But we could, we know we replace the tires on a car, change the oil, maybe even paint it. But when it gets to changing out the engine or the transmission, we're going, it's not cost effective to do that. Let's get another car. In my, we just sold my mom's house. Her house needs electrical fixing. Her house needs plumbing fixing. Well, to get to all that, it's not the faucets. It's the stuff behind the walls. To get to that, I gotta tear out the walls. So these systems that we're talking about, these are concrete buildings. And so they're, they're deep in there. So certainly you use schedule maintenance money for the things you can fix, like a drinking fountain, but the plumbing that goes behind that wall all the way out to the point of connection is very expensive to get to. So what many districts are doing with their schedule maintenance money is doing the outer pieces that you can see. Painting, roofs, air conditioning units on a roof. But when they replace the air conditioning, they're usually not going through all of them because the ducts aren't usually exposed like this. 
they're usually behind a hard lid ceiling. So it's much harder to get an entire system done. And we don't have enough money to completely redo those systems. So that's why when we use this, at a certain point, we're going to get to these systems with these higher FCIs. Maybe it's time we do replace the building. Now, in the renovations we were talking about with state money, they give 75% because they assume you are going to rip those walls out. You're going to get to everything but the bare bones structural system, and you are going to replace those systems. But that's 75% of a full replacement. So it's, that's why I say we use different pieces of data to help make that decision. Because in your example, I would absolutely agree. I would fix those things on my house. To the point where, but I wouldn't do that to the point where I had a vacant slab and had to build it from the ground up, right? When things are behind the wall, they're much more difficult to get to. Well, I recognize that these are big numbers on this chart, but when I looked at your example, which was this administration building, I have a hard time in my mind justifying them. I mean, this building is probably better built than anything else we have. And to say that um, X million dollars needs to be included in that number because it's, quote, beyond useful life mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you would go to the courthouse downtown here and say that about the courthouse, and it would be a horrible idea to tear it down and say, oh, we need a new one because it's old. Right. I mean, that bothers me in the sense that I think the system is stacked against something that um, potentially is a very good building just because of the way these things are evaluated. There, there are. I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm agreeing with you and debating with you at the same time respectfully. Yeah. Um, we've all seen a 1956 Chevy going down the road, right? Beautiful mm -hmm. car. That 1956 Chevy can't compete with a 2018 car. It's got more steel. It's classic. But it, you can't put enough technology in that to match my 2016 car, right? It's, that tech, it's how it performs. You can't make that 1956 Chevy get better gas mileage, better smog control. So it's, it takes more and more money to renovate something to get it to the current technology. The structure of that car is there, right? It's just beefier, but you can't replace that, make it more efficient to get down to the frame and make it a lighter frame to make it more efficient. These buildings are much more than just an envelope. You know, there are places where students learn, and there's air quality issues, there's energy performance issues, there's the structure as well, there's acoustical issues, and some of them you can mitigate, and some of them you just can't. That's the decision you have to make when you're evaluating each of these buildings to say, is it more cost to renovate it? And in some cases, yes, and in other cases, no. There's a lot of folks, brighter than me, that can come to that conclusion. We're just using pieces of data to help us justify it. But I'd, I'd like to end this with saying sometimes you are absolutely correct and sometimes it's better to demolish them. But it's an individual evaluation. Just like the 1956 Chevy, I love them. I couldn't live in one. Mm -hmm. I had three conference calls on the way here with my Bluetooth. And the dash was telling me when I was over speeding, I can't do that in those older cars. I can't get 40 miles to the gallon like my Prius in a 1956 Chevy. But man, it looks good. Well. I'm not buying your car analogy. <laughs> Frankly, I think you picked one that doesn't fit. <laughs> but, but it was, you know, I mean, I want you to give me the answers here. There's no problem. Um, tell me about the the science building. I mean, the uh, sports pavilion building. I don't recall hearing that there was a seismic issue there. Um, and, you know, campus center seismic issue turned out to be quite fixable for under a million dollars. Why would we tear it down for that kind of an issue? What's different about the sports pavilion? Because the things that are listed as issues for our phys ed building, you know, in, in the plan we discussed last time, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, gym floor, locker rooms, and cracks and deck surfaces. That, to me, isn't tearing it down. It's fixing it. Um, not being the structural engineer, I know there was a structural analysis done on that building. And the structural engineer that evaluated, there are certain categories before Sacramento would ever um, approve it. And that, I think it's a category, seismic category four, which says with any sort of major earthquake, the building's going to come down. So that engineer did the analysis, came to that conclusion, 
And then the architect had to decide, is it fixable? The most cost-effective means, is it to fix it, meaning um, renovate it, or replace the building? And doing their fiscal analysis, they came to replacing the building. So there is a report. I didn't create it. Um, but it basically says it's more, one, we have structural issues, enough for the state to classify it as a safety issue and give us, at least get us on a spending plan. And um, it's cheaper, in their opinion, to replace it than to renovate it. In that situation, as I mentioned, you wouldn't be able to grow it. Whatever the square footages are in the categories, you'd have to do a direct replacement. Sometimes a seismic issue can just be mitigated, just the seismic piece. In this case, the structural engineer didn't think so. But I've done some seismic projects at some of my campuses. And for example, using the wall behind me or in front of me, you end up with concrete braces. It's just the cheapest way to fix it. So if you did something locally just to fix that issue, um, it didn't include all of the, the put back, the carpet, the gym floor. It was just the seismic issue. But in this case, because the engineer said it was cheaper to replace it, then you get the benefit of all those the other things being new. But it's, it's, there are always third-party independents that have to rigidly be justified because you're going against a massive bureaucracy in Sacramento that's looking for ways to say no. Well, I, it's a report I would like to see because, frankly, I don't recall ever hearing there was a seismic issue for that building. And, you know, maybe I've forgotten, but um, I certainly would want to know. And the work that we're doing at Campus Center is not required. It's voluntary work. And that was, that was described to us as a seismic issue, but when you really got into the details, it was not that big a deal to do something. One thing on the campus center, though, you have to remember is, is that, that that remediation that we're going through with that is only for a, an eight to 10 year period of time. It's not gonna last us for 40 or 50 years right. or whatever. And I so that was, one that. Of, that was one of the issues with that. But the issue that you step back from this and you say, all of my buildings need things. Pretty much all of our buildings need things. Um, and so what we hope to get to is a discussion of priorities. You know, what are our priorities for these buildings? And unfortunately, we haven't ever yet had that discussion as a board. Um, so I would hope we have that discussion before we say what building we really want, what kind of funding we really want from the state that, you know, so that the whole thing comes together with the facility master plan and makes sense uh, as one package. What we have right now with this particular building um, doesn't immediately leap out to me as the number one reason we need state funding. Uh, student services I'm pretty interested in because every student needs to use that building. Um, that's a high value building for what seemed to me to be a large number of students, which is certainly a criteria I would look at. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do, and I think you can see the direction that Lindsay and I are trying to take with, all, with this educational process, is to have you understand um, in an open way the information that Eric's presented the information that Rob and Lindsay presented last board meeting, and then start pulling all this, the pieces together in some kind of culmination of a facilities master plan where the prioritization can take place. But you have to understand these components first before mm -hmm. we, we start talking about that. So that, that's kind of the direction we're headed with all this. Yeah, no, so I, that's I, a I nice really appreciate that. I mean, that's where we've needed to learn about it so we can then make informed judgments about it, and, and I feel like we've been really in the dark on this one um, till now, until you have brought this information to us. So your presentation was timely and well received. Thank Thanks you. Again. Marty? Um, I just want to say, I think, um, I, I, I too, I'm a, a data geek too, so I love numbers and I love looking and saying what year was this built and mm -hmm. what's wrong with it and all that. So this is really wonderful. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, on the other hand, I don't, I think when the um, chancellor's office says, gosh, this building is much better off to replace it. 
than to what it, modernize it or, or spend money on this part and this part and this part. I think we really have to listen. And that was told to us a while ago, maybe in 2012, about the Campus Center. Um, I think that what we need to do, and I'm really glad we have this, and I appreciate the last uh, report. I think we did too much arguing about HVACs or something. I didn't <laughs> quite get what we were doing, but, but I did appreciate all the information. I really liked it. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is I think it's really important for us not to argue with the chancellor's office, but to actually take a look at it in a realistic way and say, you know, uh, you can disagree with them, but I'm not sure what that would get you. So that's <laughs> my bottom line is um, I do appreciate this, and I think that I don't think we all agree on, on this panel on our uh, among the trustees as to which building and what to do and all that. So I appreciate that we're looking at it in a broader way and that we can then move forward with a better plan for us because right now we're we, we don't agree. Marsha and I definitely do not agree. You know, we can sit down with coffee and talk about it, but I, I just, I don't like spending money on a building that I know I'm gonna want to take it down, you know, in the next few years. So that's, that's where I am uh, with this. Correct me if I'm wrong, just to make sure I understand the procedure. I think we proposed to the chancellor's office that it was cheaper to tear it down. That's the first step, isn't no, it? No, I was on the facilities committee at the time, and we didn't propose it to start no, I with. I think that's how the we IPP asked. and the FPP work. We put in the proposal, correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. So we the district's, it's the district's five-year plan sent to the state that identifies the projects. And right. And the, the, the gym was in that plan. The gym, and then it, yeah. it was proposed um, right. that we have an issue, and then we had to prove it to them that there was an issue. And whenever it came up, historically, we were, the discussion was it doesn't matter what's in the plan or whether it reflects our priorities when it came to the board. And, and that was frustrating. But that's nothing that you had control over. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, uh, Robert, do you have a? As, as the newcomer here, what I'm taking away from your presentation is we can very well decide among us what we would like to do. And we got a presentation at our uh, last meeting about things that need to be done. And I think probably all of us thought, whoa, you know, it'd be great to do all that. But you're, you're communicating, to me at least, that we have to really, really understand how the process works in Sacramento and the metrics they're using to make these decisions. Because the metrics they use to make those decisions May, may tell us we can't really get that. We have a better chance of getting this over here, even though that maybe is our priority two. Yeah. We want it priority one, but knowing how the system works, get real, it ain't gonna happen. You, we should go to priority two. I mean, is, is that the message that we, we there's, should be receiving? There's certainly, that there, you're talking about the strategy. Yes. Um, let me throw something else out as well. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, but many boards decide we have a need, and then who can fund that need? Can it be Sacramento? If not, we still have a need. Our students have a need, and that's where boards start contemplating local bonds. You've seen the need here in, re in repairs. If your facilities educational master plan says we have a need, and the state says we don't fund that need or you're not competitive enough, some boards will say, then we need to contemplate the local tax base to see if it will support it because it's all for the benefit of the students. It's, again, all of that data to help you make a management decision. But in your, your, um, your analogy, which is what I used earlier with my three-legged dog and a four-legged dog race, I didn't have a local bond at my last district. And so we had to get some state money. And so it was sometimes we couldn't get what we wanted. We could get what we could get. And we tried to base that strategy on student need. So most of them were renovations. If they were growth, it was because the numbers, the enrollment numbers allowed it. And they were based on what supported the educational master plan first. If there was, and I'll give you the example because I teach it in my class and it was real life. We had a trustee when I first started the district says, I don't know what all the numbers mean, but I know we have a need for more nurses out in the industry. I'm getting older and I need help. And the board agreed with that, and we put that in the ed plan that they were gonna basically double the amount of nurses. We didn't have a local bond, 
And we went, I knew pretty well about the strategy. We went through that process without a local bond and were able to secure a nursing building. It was a lower scoring project, but it happened to be on a year when there weren't a lot of projects in that category. And I will tell you that there are students learning in that building today. But that may or may not have happened. We may have submitted that proposal six times and not got there. But it was driven from the bottom up from an educational master plan. So all this data has, you know, is, can be powerfully used by us. We, we, we have to understand. We have to understand it. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's going to be the hard part for us, is to really understand the data and how to use it as you've explained. And that's where I, I try to help the district. If you're leaning in a direction like most districts are, we've mentioned it, student service needs. Student services are always changing. I'm the one that says, hey, there might be an opportunity for student services. So I find, based on the numbers, some opportunities. And then we might say, no, that's just not in the ed plan. We, you know, and I've had others come to me and go, we, we want to double our science capacity. And we look at the numbers and say, you can't double your science capacity unless you take away another building somewhere else. And they're not willing to say, we're going to get rid of a program to double science. So in that situation, we go, the state can't help you or won't help you double your growth. It would be like if you were asking me here, we want to get a new science building. We want to, we're saying the numbers don't substantiate growth. So if you wanted to do that, you'd have to do it with your own money. But your ed plan might say, beyond that, we don't care about the state standards. We need another, a bigger science building. And that's why you, you would then shift to another pot of money based on your need. Thank you. Peter. Uh, just to follow up, not only do we have to understand <clears throat> the data, we have to trust the data. Uh, and the thing that keeps harping in my mind is, uh, would it ever be useful to consider having a second opinion to support the first or to set the, si the first opinion aside. And I'm thinking in particular of the architectural review of the sports pavilion that came to a conclusion with which we may have a problem. What about a second opinion? Is that ever done? It typically is done before the submittal, the proposal submitted. Because yeah. yeah. in the state size, we vetted it. Sure. We've, we've went through the analysis, we've had third party, and that's why they make us do a third party, because obviously if I wanted a new gym and I was the beneficiary, I could fuzzy up the math. So they make it be a third party independent, and those folks put their license on the line. So the state's perspective is it's been vetted locally before it's submitted to the state. Sure. Um, if we were going to do that now, you probably would need to withdraw that project and do whatever we want to do locally and then resubmit it at another year. But we would get out of line. It, it, as I mentioned, it's a zero-based program. We would get out of line. We would come back and say we do or don't want it. Um, the one challenge we have here is it has been, because of this um, engineering report, it has been shown you have a safety issue with your building. Jonathan, do you okay. Have Thanks. Jonathan, you good? Oh, I'm good, yeah. <clears throat> You want to add one more comment? Yeah, I, following up on your decide your needs and then look for the money comment. Um, one of the things I already mentioned, HVAC systems, we have needs across campus for that. Is it possible to look for the money in uh, Prop 39 because they're old systems and there would be an energy savings to um, get to new systems closer to your cars? <laughs> So good question. We didn't talk about Prop 39 because it's not a chancellor's office. They, they, they approve it, but it's, I felt that it wasn't worth mentioning, but we'll go over it now if you don't mind, because it's in year five of a five-year program. Mm -hmm. So um, FTES based, again, for the money that was in it. So Prop 39, I believe it was a tobacco tax, and there was money put in coffers to fund energy saving projects. And districts got an allocation at the district level for each year, five one-year programs. And then in every year, the district had to identify those same projects that you're mentioning. But they had to be energy, a mathematical formula that showed they were energy efficient. Um, so we couldn't just replace an energy, uh, HVAC unit because it was old. We had to replace it with something that would pay for itself in the energy savings at 110% uh, of the value over the life of that new widget, if you don't mind me saying so. So most folks did the lower hanging fruit that was obvious which was um, exterior lights, because we, we are now in the day of LED lights, and there's a tremendous cost effectiveness on these lights. Most districts didn't even get to the HVAC because there wasn't enough money there. 
Well, we're currently in year five of a five-year program. And again, there were $150,000, $200,000. I don't know what your allocation is, but it was in the hundreds of thousands, not the millions. And there is going to be a, a program after this fifth year, but it's unfunded. So they didn't kill the program, they killed the funding. And until the governor puts money in it, then we have a Prop 39 program. But in some cases, if it was the highest need of the district and it showed that it was cost effective energy wise, then yes, they would have done that. I suspect your district said we have a higher need and a more bigger payback, as you mentioned, as we looked at the, um, the energy calculator with those savings. We made some tremendous savings here. So it may have been that lighting was a higher priority for energy savings and to meet the needs of that grant than HPC. No, I, I, I agree. It's just that I, I was looking on the Chancellor's Office website and I saw that January of this year, they're calling for projects. They have another 20 million left in Prop 39. And you're good. And so I would say, why not ask? That. You're good, <laughs> very good. Okay, um, if we look at that memo, and let me explain that memo. So. Basically, they're saying there's a whole bunch of districts here. They're not going to spend their money. There's 20 million in the bucket. If you don't spend it, district, by May, we're going to reallocate it. What would you say if you were the president of one of those districts on the list? Go spend it. Get on it. So as of last month, there's only 15 million. What's expected is there'll be 500,000. And districts are lining up for what's left, my district included. We have to go through all of the engineering gyrations to get on that waiting list for whatever the size of the bucket of money's left. And there's a high criteria, high bar for, again, there's a, there's a criteria to get that money, the highest savings to investment ratio. Well, most of us have used all of our lights, which were the highest ratio, so it's difficult to get it done. But it's a dwindling bucket very fast. On that same website, if you go back about a week or two, um, they put out another memo. And in mm -hmm. committee last week, it was down to 15. But they told us projected based on district commitments because of that peer pressure, which I think may have been part of this memo, um, that there's, there was projected to be 500,000. Yeah, that tells me there's probably going to be in unallocated million. funding. So I took that to mean we hadn't figured out who to give it to you, they, the they, 20 was, million. I think it was, from what I was reading, it was unencumbered. They, it was allocated to the district, but it wasn't encumbered yet by the district. And there was actually a list of every district on it um, that hadn't encumbered their money. And no, if they I saw that, but I'm reading unallocated funding in the yeah, letter. Yeah, so I, I think they're using the term allocated of actually giving authority to the district to spend it, but it's on the list because it was mentioned by district and the amount the district had to lose, right? So it was purely allocated just by being on that sheet. Uh, but I am following it very close. Mm -hmm because I'm an opportunist, mm -hmm. right? And I want my district to be in line for that money, but I also warned every president, we have to expend money to get it engineered, to get it ready, but in my mind, that bucket is gonna be very small with money by the time May comes. We're gonna have a very short window. They'll, they'll appropriate that every month about the 12th of May, and then they're gonna say how much is left after that final appropriation. Mm -hmm. And we're expected to be much, much smaller than 15, 20, which you saw, but it's down to 15 as of a couple weeks ago. Thank you, Mr. Middlestead. You know, we started our board meeting hearing from people that just love to work here. And so thank you to the board for a great discussion because this discussion is reflective that we want amazing facilities for the people that love to work here, amazing facilities for our students, for teaching and learning. And you did a great job because this is not my area of specialty. So thank you for making it comprehensible and for all the input and output that everybody gave. Um, and so with that, if the board is okay, we can end this closed discussion. And what a terrific idea. <laughs> We will um, wish you safe travels, or unless you're staying the night in our beautiful city, which typically does not have this weather, but tomorrow the sun will meetings on my Bluetooth and my Prius on the way home. Today. Well, we wish you safe travels, and we dearly thank yeah, you for your time. It was very appreciated. So that brings us to item 6.1. Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? Motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. I'll second. Okay. Motion, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Hmm? Energy efficiency.